Hello everyone, please settle down and we will be starting in a few minutes. Please join us in singing the Philippine National Anthem. May we acknowledge the presence of the following, Dr. Nimia Simbulan, Dean Estacio, and distinguished faculty members. To all our guests and live audience, a pleasant morning to all of you. I am Patricia Maitito. And I am Haven Urbase from the Organization of Area Studies Majors, and we will be your hosts for today. We are gathered here today on the 26th of May the fourth of five webinars organized by UC Manila in commemoration of the centennial of the Magellan Institute of the Navigation of the World and the We are gathered here today on the 21st of May, the fourth of five webinars organized by UP Manila in commemoration of the quincentennial of the Magellan's expeditions, first circumnavigation of the world, and the role that Filipinos played in it. This event will not be possible without the hard work of the UP Manila Quincentennial Commemoration Committee with the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, with special thanks to the Department of Social Sciences and the Organization of Area Studies Majors. Now, may we, may we first call on Dr. Celestina P. Bongkan, from the Department of Social Sciences to deliver the opening remarks and explanation of the theme. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. At the start of this year, University of the Philippines President Danilo L. Concepcion 
created an ad hoc committee on UP's celebration of the Kincentennial Commemoration in celebration of the 500 year anniversary of the circumnavigation of the world made by the Ferdinand Magellan expedition and the role that the Philippines played in this historic event. The University of the Philippines Manila participation is a series of webinars to be held in the month of May, 2021, focusing on two themes. The first is on health since UP Manila is the health sciences center of the UP system. The second is on Manila, in particular, the district of Ermita, where UP Manila is located. The schedule of webinars and the particular topic for the day are as follows. May 7, on Filipino concept of health. May 14, on institutions of healing. May 19, on Sinaunang Kamay Nilaan. May 21, on Ermita, suburb of Manila, and May 28, on weather forecasting in the Philippines. The webinars start at 9 o'clock in the morning and end at 12 o'clock noon. For these webinars, UP Manila has invited resource speakers who are experts in their respective fields and are at the top of their class. We assure everyone of a fruitful and insightful three hours of listening to our resource speakers in this webinar series that we have put together for the UP Quincentennial Commemoration. On behalf of Dr. Carmen Sita Di Padilla, Chancellor and Professor of UP Manila, it is with great pride and honor that we invite you to join us in this worthy endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bongkan. Now, to formally welcome our guests, may we call on Dr. Dimia Simbulan, the Vice Chancellor for Academic Good Affairs, evening. to Thank deliver the welcoming Dr. remarks. Paraming salamat. Isang mainit na pagbati sa mga bumubuo ng UP Quincentennial Commemoration Committee na pinangungunahan ni na Vice President for Public Affairs, uh, Vice President Elena Pernia, Tagapangulo at ni Professor Neil Marshall Santillan, Co-Chair. Vice Chancellor for Administration Arlene Samaniego, mga piling tagapagsalita, mga dekano at dekana, mga guro at estudyante, isang pagbati sa inyong lahat at maraming salamat sa inyong pagdalo sa ikaapat na webinar na inorganisa ng UP Manila kaugnay ng, kaugnay ng pagdiriwang sa kinsentenaryong paggunita sa sirkumnabigasyon ng mundo at matagumpay na labanan sa maktan laban sa mga kolonyalistang Kastila. Ang sentro ng presentasyon ngayong umaga ng ating mga piling tagapagsalita ay ang Ermita, Arabal, suburb ng Maynila. Tatalakayin ng ating mga tagapagsalita ang iba't ibang larawan at aspeto ng buhay ng mamamayan, partikular ng mga kababaihan sa Ermita, disenyo at arkitektura, ng mga istruktura at gusali sa ermita noong panahon ng kolonyalismo sa bansa. Ipapamalas kung bakit makasaysayan ang bahaging ito ng Maynila at ang kahalagahang patuloy na mapangalagaan at mapreserba ang mga historikal na bahagi ng lugar na ito. At dahil ang UP Manila ay matatagpuan sa ermita, Nararapat lamang na malaman at maging pamilyar tayo sa kasaysayan ng lugar na naging bahagi ng ating mga pang-araw-araw na buhay bilang mga kawani, estudyante, bago sa panahon at pagkatapos ng pandemya. 
So inaanyayahan ko po tayong uh, makinig sa ating mga piling tagapagsalita ngayong umaga. Maraming salamat. Thank you, Dr. Nemia, for your, warm, for your warm welcomes. Now, before we proceed to our lectures, here are some reminders. We will open the floor for questions at the end of the event, so kindly hold all your questions and comments until then. Also, please refrain from spamming the chat box while the speakers are presenting. Thank you and enjoy the series of lectures today. Now, we hand over the floor to our first speaker. May we invite Professor Sharon Karnal to introduce our first speaker. Isang maganda at mapagpalayang umaga po sa ating lahat. Isang malaking karangalan na maatasan na magpakilala ng ating mga pinagpipitagang tagapagsalita ngayong umaga. Ang ating unang tagapagsalita ay kilalang mananalaysay at kasalukuyang Professor Emeritus sa kagawaran ng kasaysayan sa UP Diliman. Siya ay nagtapos ng Bachelor of Arts in Education, Major in History, at Master of Arts in Teaching sa UP Diliman. Dahil sa kanyang kagalingan bilang mag-aaral at professor ng kasaysayan, siya ay napagkalooban ng Scholarship Award ng French Government noong 1979 hanggang 1982 kung saan niya natapos ang dalawa pang postgraduate degrees, Master in Geography mula sa University of Paris noong 1980 at Doctorate in History mula sa School of Higher Studies in Social Sciences noong 1982. Ang ating panauhin ay lalo pang nakilala sa larangan ng kasaysayan dahil sa dami at karidad ng mga naisulat na akademikong papel na naipresenta sa parehong lokal at internasyonal na konferensya at kalaunan ay nailithala bilang journal article o kabanatan ng libro o buong libro. Ang mga paksa ng kanyang mga pagsasaliksik ay nakasentro sa social history, women's studies, at revolution studies. Karamihan sa mga naisulat at napublish na mga artikulo ay bahagi na ngayon ng mga babasahin sa iba't ibang asignaturang pangkasaysayan at pati na rin sa agham panlipunan. Ang kanyang librong pinamagatang kasaysayang panlipunan ng Maynila, 1765 hanggang 1878, ay ginawaran ng 1993 National Book Award ng Manila Critics Circle. Ang kaparehong award ay binigay din sa kanya noong 1995 para naman sa isa pang libro na pinamagatang Working Women of Manila in the 19th century. Sa pandaigdigang larangan, ang ating tagapagsalita ay ginawaran din ng prestigyosong Chevalier de Palms Academics na ibinigay ng pamahalaang Pransya noong 2006. Ang ating panauhin ay hindi lang profesor at mananaliksik, siya rin ay isang administrador. At humawak ng ilang mahahalagang posisyon, katulad ng tagapangulo ng kagawaran ng kasaysayan, Deputy Director, Centro ng Bikang Pilipino, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, College of Social Sciences and Philosophy, lahat ito sa UP Diliman, Direktor ng UP Press, pinuno ng pananaliksik sa kasaysayan, sa kasaysayan ng Pambansang Komisyon sa Kultura at Sini, at Presidente ng Pai Gamma Mu, Honor Society in the Social Sciences, Philippine Alpha Chapter. Malugod ko pong pinapakilala sa inyo ang ating unang tagapagsalita na magtatalakay ng paksang Occupation of Women in Arbita in the 19th century, wala pong iba kung hindi si Professor Emeritus Maria Luisa T. Kamagay. Dr. Kamagay, nakamute pa po. Okay na po. Ah, okay. Nakamute ba ako? Um, okay na po. Okay. Maraming salamat, Professor uh, Karingal, uh, sa uh, parang ano na eh, uh, eulogy na. No, but uh, anyway, I'm very thankful for the introduction. Um, uh, at uh, talagang um, isang karangalan na maging bahagi ng uh, webinar series na ito. At um, nagpapasalamat rin ako kasi 
kahit sa pandemyang ito ay nakuha ko pa rin magsulat at manliksik tungkol sa kababaihan ng ermita nung ikalabing siyam na dantaon. So, uh, share, uh, share screen ko na. Ato, ma'am. O, oh, sige. Pwede na po. Pwede na. Parang ina na nila. Saan ka saan? Okay. Nakikita po namin, ma'am, ang screen. Nakikita na. So, uh, I will now, uh, from beginning, and then, what will I do, um, Alvin? Ma'am, full screen na lang po, kagaya kanina, yun sa lower right corner. And lower Apa. right. Apa, lower na. right. Ito. Yung katabi po, yan. Ah, okay. Okay na po. Okay, uh, so, uh, ang paksa ko ngayon umaga ay occupations of women in Ermita in the 19th century. And as I said, I'm very thankful for this opportunity because it allowed me to really focus on uh, the women of Ermita. Uh, because the book uh, I wrote on working women of Manila was really very um, uh, general in terms of um, uh, Manila. But it's interesting that uh, I did focus on Ermita. And I was very fortunate that I had data because I could not go to the archives nor do research, but I had data uh, which uh, was gathered while I was writing the book. And I had a padron or a list of inhabitants of Ermita in, uh, at a certain time. But, uh, so I was very uh, happy and I thank the Lord for that opportunity that I had data for this particular uh, presentation. Okay, so I'll start. Now, Ermita in the 19th century, uh, as uh, was mentioned, was an Arabales or a suburb of Manila. And at the time, Manila referred to Intramuros. So it's, uh, Ermita was an Arabales of Manila, no? uh, meaning uh, a suburb of Manila. It was also a pueblo or a town of the provincia de Tondo at the time. And as a pueblo, it had a governor, uh, governor Silio and a cura paroco. And it was located along the coast of Manila Bay and was described as having fertile soil and a benign climate. Uh, in the middle of the 19th century, Ermita was said to have 1,892 houses uh, which uh, were um, made of touch and bamboo, yung atin ni house. The stone edifices consisted of the church, the Casa Tribunal, or the town hall, and a few homes. Now, this is the old church of Ermita, uh, probably before the war. Uh, it, it, uh, it's a picture of uh, uh, Ermita church before the war. But it's now uh, the present no? um, pre uh, picture of uh, the Church of Ermita. Now, previously, the church was administered by a secular priest. Uh, by, uh, it's, it was, uh, at the 19th century, administered by a secular priest. But previous to this, was under the supervision of the Augustinians. This is the interior now of uh, Ermita Church. And uh, it, it enshrines the image of the Nuestra Señora de Guía or Our Lady of Guidance. Uh, this image was uh, said to be discovered by the soldiers of Miguel de Legazpi among pandan plants in 1571. And it has been venerated by the natives, they say long before the Spaniards arrived in the Philippines. Fray Juan de la Concepcion, in his work, Historia General de Filipinas, suspects that the image came from India, which had been visited by the Apostle Thomas. The image is considered miraculous and has been invoked by sailors to guide them safely to the shores of Manila. It, I, I think uh, there is some truth no, to the, the fact that it must have come from, because it's a different kind of image um, 
that we see with the, let's say, uh, the early images uh, brought in by uh, the Spaniards. Uh, I say the, because of the, of the position of the hands, it's very Indian no? uh, compared to the other images uh, uh, before. Now, in the event of a delay in the arrival of the galleons from Mexico, this image was brought to the Manila Cathedral for intercession. Now, this was, uh, I think uh, I, think I uh, saw it in your uh, cover page, the Manila Observatory built in 1865. And from this particular uh, vantage point, we see pictures taken of Ermita. So uh, it's true that uh, it was um, composed of houses made of uh, uh, thatch and bamboo. And uh, this part uh, of uh, Manila was really uh, very rustic. The, no, the, the southern part of the Pasig River was rustic. The northern part, like Binondo, Santa Cruz, was already, um, let's say, uh, urbanized, but here, uh, Ermita remained uh, rustic and, uh, and rural. This is again another image of Ermita taken from the Manila Observatory. And there would be some uh, fields. I, I presume this would be uh, 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 palai fields. Then uh, another image of Ermita we see, uh, it uh, looks out into the Manila Bay. And you see the Church of Ermita, the towers of it uh, also there in uh, close to the uh, Manila Bay. And the main road of Ermita, uh, it links uh, er, uh, Intramuros and Ermita as well as Malate. And this main road led up to Cavite. Uh, you see the rails of the tramvia on the left. Okay, so uh, going to, to the topic of this um, uh, webinar, which is uh, um, uh, talk, I, uh, the Padron which I consulted was 1886 to 1887. And I was very happy because they segregated the, uh, these are all women, no? Uh, uh, inhabitants of Ermita in 1886 to 1887. So uh, when I took a look at um, the occupations, uh, you would have varying. You have a costurera there, a cigarrera, a lavandera, a tindera, a burdadora, a domestica, a servant, pescadora, jornalera, matrona, cucinera, zapatera, tabaquera, uh, cuchera, mendicante, your beggar, labrador, and a sastre. Okay. But the five leading occupations of women in Ermita were the following. So uh, many costureras no? uh, or seamstress, mga mananahi. Uh, second, marami rin cigarera. No? You have a lot of uh, cigar maker women. Burdadora followed, Lavandera, and Tindera. Okay, so uh, uh, I will follow this order of uh, uh, leading occupations in my short talk. Okay, the Costurera of Ermita. As we know, in the 19th century, they were indispensable as everything was hand sewn from clothes, curtains, bed linens, table linens, etc. And their presence complemented the work of the embroiderers of Ermita since things had to be hand sewn before they were embroidered. And towards the later part of the 19th century, singer sewing machines were already being advertised. But still, uh, that was expensive, so things had to be hand sewn. Because of their great number, their wages were low. So here is what, for example, a woman will have to uh, be uh, her, her apparel. No? You have the baro at saya, and this had to be hand sewn. So your baro is the blouse, the upper part. Then you have the saya, 
uh, the skirt. Then you have the tapis, no, and uh, the bl the black uh, uh, wrap, and of course your uh, alampai, which is your uh, the one which is a scarf over the the baro. This is supposed to be uh, to wipe your perspiration. If you don't have a salakot, you can put it over your head as well. Okay. Now, uh, why did I feel that they were not really paid that high? Here is a folk song about a costurera. And it reads, Angge is my pet name. Dressmaking is my trade. All day long till evening, my poor hands are always sewing. No matter how hard I work, not a penny I can save. Alas, I can earn only just enough for food and rent. So uh, usually the working conditions of the costurera, she reported to work in the homes of uh, the customer. And in some of uh, some households, the costurera was part of the retinue of servants. And uh, Frederick Sawyer in his book, uh, who was an Englishman in Manila during the 19th century, paid his costurera $6 a month. Now, the arrival of Americans increased the wages of the costureras uh, to the distress of the natives, Spanish mestizos, and Chinese uh, mestizos. So, for example, you have a comment of an American woman. When I arrived here, quote, uh, I worked uh, nine hours you know, for uh, a seamstress work, nine hours for so many uh, cents, gold, and her dinner. Now in Manila, a seamstress, seamstress working for Americans received 50 cents gold and sometimes 75 cents gold and her dinner, though the Chinese, the Spanish, Filipinos, and Chinese pay less. Now, when I took a look at the, uh, the Padron de Vecindarios, in terms of age, most of the costureras were in the age bracket of, uh, uh, let's say, 20 to 39 years old. In terms of their status, 183 were solteras or single women. And then you have 164 casadas or married women and 60 were viudas or widowed women. The youngest costurera was 18 years old and the oldest was 71. The list of costureras of Ermita included the names of 22 women donas who may belong to the upper class. And it is probable that these women had dress shops and had costureras under their employ. Now we go to the second, the cigarreras of Ermita. With the end of the government tobacco monopoly in 1882, uh, production of cigars went into private hands. And there was a cigar factory located in San Marcelino. And the name of the factory was, was La Constancia. And this may have employed women from Ermita because uh, you have to imagine that uh, the place should be walking distance now from the home and the factory. So uh, it was within the vicinity. And the women were hired because they were adept in rolling cigars and were honest. That is, they were not prone to smuggling out of the factory cigars. So uh, those were the two. Uh, uh, qualities of women, uh, cigarette or the cigarreras, uh, their uh, skill of rolling cigars, and second, their honesty. So good was the Filipino cigarera that the Dutch entrepreneurs later would send them to Surabaya in Indonesia to train uh, Indonesian women there to roll cigars. Okay. Uh, this is how the cigarera works. She is like an assembly uh, plan. No? It, uh, so uh, cigarreras uh, numbering 10 were seated uh, on the floor around a low table. Two were tasked to moisten, stretch, and remove the stem of the tobacco leaf. Seven rolled the cigars, while one bundled and weighed the cigars. 
those who were assigned the task of rolling the cigars were provided with a stone as large as a lemon with which to beat the tobacco leaf. Once the leaf was rendered pliable, the cigarera would put small quantity of chopped tobacco at the center of the leaf and uh, a little gum at, the, at one edge and then would roll it to its desired form. So this is how they would look like. No? Uh, of course, this one uh, is already when uh, the tobacco monopoly uh, ceased. So these are some um, uh, private the uh, old uh, companies of uh, cigar um, makers. Another picture of how the cigarreras uh, um, were uh, assembled. No? So they sit on the floor in front of them would be a low table like a dulang and then you have them working uh, uh, like a, uh, a by table, in other words. And uh, here is also just to give you an idea how important the cigarreras were in the 19th century was uh, during the time of the, the government monopoly, you would have this uh, uh, print of, uh, because there was uh, a factory uh, close to Binondo Church. So this is, uh, you have the Binondo Church and you have the two uh, buildings there, which was the administrative building and the factory uh, proper. So the Fabrica de Tabaco is number two and number one is the Casa de uh, la Dirección. And uh, these were women uh, entering now uh, the tobacco factory. Uh, so they really were, a first, I would consider them the first urban workers of Manila. Okay. Now, in the case of the Cigarera of Ermita, the uh, age bracket that she would uh, uh, belong to would be uh, 20 to 39 years old. So they were uh, 20 to 39 years old. Then uh, there were 87 casados, married women, 61 solteras or unmarried women, and 32 uh, viudas or widowed. And that's why it's so interesting to look at the padron because they give you so much information about women, if they are married, if, uh, 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 in other words, their status and their ages. There were 17 women who were below 20 years old. The youngest woman employed was 18 years old and the oldest was 59 years old. Now these are the donyas uh, uh, who figured in the list of uh, cigarreras. So uh, we see, for example, Doña Agapita, Brett, et cetera, uh, 42, married, uh, and so on. No? Uh, they were um, mostly, I noticed, uh, 30s and 40s. They were there at, at that age. And uh, again, up to uh, this um, uh, list, um, you have them again, 30s and 40s. No? Uh, they're identified as Doña Petronila, Salupa, etc. Et now, some thoughts on the Donyas. I was uh, wondering. Uh, so most of the women were in their 40s and were married. The, now, the, they're having a title of Doña may mean two things. One is that they may be employed in the tobacco factory of La Constancia as supervisors or mestras and therefore receive a high wage. No? Or they may have established a home-based cigar factory with a number of workers or cigarreras in their employ. So uh, the, the wages, just to give you an idea of mestras, no? uh, will be like here, uh, they're graded mestra primera, segunda, tercera. And uh, if you're a mestra primera, you get 192 pesos annually. If segunda, 144 pesos annually and 96 pesos annually. So I presume that they had supervisory uh, um, positions in the uh, tobacco factory of La Constancia or 
they were entrepreneurs and opened a home-based cigar factory. Okay. Now the third are the Bordadoras. Oh my God, these are uh, the, uh, many European um, uh, visitors of uh, Manila paid homage to these Bordadoras. And um, the testimonies of their skill were written by foreign visitors of Manila, such as Sir John Bowring, the British governor of Hong Kong, Jean Mala, the French doctor, Fedor Yagor, the German scholar, uh, Com Commander John Wilkes, head of the United States Explorer Exploring Expedition in 1859. Okay, so what does John Bowring say about um, uh, the Burdadoras of Ermita? So according to uh, John Bowring, he said La Ermita, and other villages are remarkable for their embroideries or for their bordadoras, who produce these exquisite piña handkerchiefs for which large sums are paid. A small handkerchief costs one or two ounces of gold. No? And this is lifted from his book, A Visit to the Philippine Islands by Sir John Bowery. The other one is by John Mala. And John Malak says, and I quote, when the piña is plain, which is not usual, one has it embroidered by the embroiderers of Ermita and Malate near Manila or Intramuros in this kind of work. The embroideries that they turn out offer proof of an almost unbelievable patience. They are an admit admirable beauty which would be impossible to imitate in Europe because the workmanship would be an exorbitant price. The most notable and most pleasing are those called the dihilados and the uh, uh, los dihilados and los calados. These are open work uh, embroideries. Fidoria Gore says, in the Philippines, where the fineness of the work is best understood and appreciated. Uh, richly embroidered costumes of the description have fetched more than 20,000 reals each. And lastly, Charles Week says, uh, Commander uh, Charles Week, who uh, headed the United States Exploring Expedition, visited one of the the houses of Manila, presumably in Ermita, where skilled women were embroidering piña, a great variety of dresses, scarves, caps, collars, cuffs, and pocket handkerchiefs were demonstrated. Uh, this is uh, from the book of Piña by uh, Lourdes Montinola. So just example of the uh, uh, piña uh, work done by the women of Ermita. So you see, uh, here on the left, a picture of a very richly embroidered barro. And uh, what is noticeable, it was really, the, the sleeve really becomes wider. Uh, the early uh, sleeves of women, they were just straight. But uh, towards the end of the 19th century, the sleeves of the barro became uh, wider. And uh, it became a very good uh, opportunity to um, have this embroidered. So not only is the barro, but even the panuelo is uh, heavily embroidered. And uh, it would cost really uh, sums of money uh, at the time. I have a, um, a suspicion that the reason why the sleeve change was uh, it was an influence of a leg of mutton sleeves in Europe, which was big, uh, wider, wider uh, than a usual uh, uh, sleeve. Now, some refer to this as the angel uh, sleeve. So men also had their uh, baron, uh, heavily embroidered. Uh, you see it uh, from the left, it's really calado. Uh, there you see it's an uh, open uh, embroidery and the same here uh, of the, the men on my on the right screen. Okay. Again, another picture of uh, that lady who, with uh, very rich 
Lee Embroidered um, uh, Baro. Here is Agida Paterno, uh, painted by Asuncion. And you see how, how intricate it really is. I mean, uh, it's really a marvel how piña, in fact, even the material of piña is really very valuable, very precious. And then you have it embroidered uh, this manner. It really becomes doubly precious you know, with the handkerchief, for example, like this one. Now, uh, the life of the Buddha Dora really relied on the uh, Sinamayera. She is the woman who sells textiles. And usually in some uh, prints, she is depicted in this manner and because you will know she is a Sinamayera because she has a bundle of cloth uh, on one hand and she is opening her puesto uh, in Rosario, Cali Rosario, which is now Quintin Paredes. So that was where the Cinemayeras uh, would uh, have their, uh, their stalls. Now, uh, most of the Buddha Doras belong to the age of uh, 20 to 39. Uh, uh, so there were 76 of them. Those in the age bracket of 40 uh, to 49, 47. And those who were uh, 60 and above, about 18. Uh, in number. The youngest Buddha Dora was a 14 years old girl and the oldest was 73 years old. There was an equal number of married Buddha Doras, 62, and single Buddha Doras, 67, and uh, widowed Buddha Doras would number uh, 41. Okay, here is a picture of uh, Buddha Doras. Um, of course, this is Amer early American period uh, already, but uh, you know, embroidery, uh, I think this one is in a school. Uh, it entered into the curriculum no, uh, of uh, women, but generally. Uh, here, these are adult uh, uh, burdadoras, and this one also. Uh, you see probably this young girl would be the one I referred to. She's so young compared to the other uh, women who are working on, uh, on, uh, on piña. Okay. Now, uh, Ermita really will become a, uh, uh, let's say a center of uh, piña uh, because I saw this advertisement uh, which said the little home shop where in a Spanish house of a bygone age, you will find a rare collection of interesting articles from all parts of the islands. Piña, a delicate cloth made only in the Philippines, woven by hand from the fiber of the pineapple and embroidered in the designs of unbe unbelievable delicacy a treasure trove for the seeker of the unusual. So Mrs. Metcalf, she has a phone number and the address is 678 A. Mabini. Now there would be donas also uh, in Ermita just uh, of the Bordadoras as compared uh, at the same time as the Cigarreras. So you have a number of them. And my thought is that the uh, we do not exactly know how much a Buddha Dora earned. Sources mentioned that she was paid low and the one who stood to gain from her skill was the Sinamayera. The Sinamayera was a source of nipis or piña and the source of the embroidery design to be executed by the Buddha Dora. The Sinamayera would most likely give it to the embroidery factory headed by the Donyas mentioned earlier for execution by her embroiderers. Okay, the fourth is the lavanderas. Of course, washing clothes is a um, uh, usually a occupation of women, though we also have lavanderos, uh, but uh, generally it would be women. And you have the lavanderas in Ermita, according to age, were distributed in this manner. So below 20, there were two, uh, 19 years old and 18. For those from 20 to 29, there were 34. From 30 to 39, um, 38. 
uh, 40 to 49, 47, 50 to 59, 17, and above 60, 11. So generally it was uh, distributed, but the heavy number would come from ages 20 to uh, 49. Uh, so as I said, one may observe an almost even distribution of lavanderas according to age. This may be explained that this occupation did not require special skill unlike of that of the costurera, the cigarera, and the burdadora. In other words, doing the laundry may have been a regular housework, but women of Ermita made it a gainful occupation. Uh, as to the status of lavanderas, 42 were married, 52 were single, uh, and uh, the rest would be uh, widows. It is likely that the single women and the widows were breadwinners of their family. Uh, laundry was collected by the lavanderas from homes brought to an estero to be laundered. In Ermita, the estero may have been the estero de balete or the estero de tangue. And soap may have been purchased from one of the stores in Calle Jaboneros in Ermita. According to Mala, they were paid 10 pesos monthly. So here's a picture of a lavandera. Here uh, also uh, a picture of lavanderas and you see them, uh, it's, a, it's a congregation of women. So it's interesting that they socialize while doing uh, work uh, like uh, uh, washing clothes. And you see uh, probably you have clothes lying there at the background and uh, nagkukula siguro yung mga clothes that you see scattered uh, uh, on the grass. And what is interesting with their very wide sleeves, when they do work, they roll it up you know, so that their hands are free, their arms are free, rather. So this is the Canal de Balete that I was referring to, um, coming from, uh, uh, we know that the, um, uh, the steros, which uh, uh, are tributaries of the Pasig River, and we presume they were still clean, unlike now. Now, the last would be the tinderas of Ermita. Selling was often an occupation that women resorted to. In terms of ages, the tinderas were distributed in the following manner. So below 4, 24, uh, 20 to 29 years old, 35, 30 to 39, 31, 40 to 49, 29, 50 to 59, 27, and 60 years and above, 11. In terms of status, 60 were married, and uh, uh, 30, uh, 38 were single, and 37 widowed. Unfortunately, the vicendario does not identify what the tindero, uh, tinderas were selling. So there is also the question whether they had stalls or sari-sari stores or were they ambulant peddlers? So here is a sari-sari store, uh, early American period, I think, uh, because of the photograph already. So, uh, or they can be ambulant like the La Tendera here, of uh, selling uh, uh, probably santol uh, on, a, on a bilao, or a tindera de bani. Uh, so we see, as I was mentioning earlier, the sleeves of the barro was very straight, not exaggerated uh, or wide uh, during the later part of the 19th century. So you have the dominance of blue because of the dye that was used. So they would use indigo, which is blue. Um, and so, and usually you have the barro uh, plain, the saya is checkered and your tapis is striped. So here is again another print of a lichera and a panadero. So the lichera is the one who sells milk. So on top of her head is the bilao with the milk and her measuring uh, instrument. Uh, and then uh, as, as you will notice again, the apparel is uh, the sleeves are still straight and checkered uh, saya and striped uh, 
you call this tapis. So you have uh, the panadero, so his bread is uh, 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 put in a sack uh, to keep it warm. Uh, so the, um, very interesting uh, tradition of the, of the common people. Usually they're unshod, no shoes. No? So that's how um, they are. La Buyera. La Buyera is the woman who sells the betel nut chew or the buyo. So we see here uh, the ingredients of the betel nut chew. So you have the betel nut, uh, which is there uh, already on top of, uh, uh, let's say, of that uh, container. Then you have, uh, so you have the bunga. Then you have the apog, which is the one on the white thing that she is uh, um, close to the buyera. And then you have the ikmo, which is the leaf. So very interesting um, uh, the stories about the buyera because uh, according to um, stories, this her stall became a, um, a place where people do standby and they try to court the beautiful buyera. So if the buyera does not like this uh, uh, man, uh, he she prepares a bitter betel nut chew. But uh, if uh, she seems uh, she thinks that this man is interesting, she makes a uh, delicious betel nut chew. So it's a sort of nonverbal communication. Okay. So also to end your uh, betel nut chew, you can have uh, uh, tubo no? to, to sweeten uh, your mouth after the uh, uh, betel nut chew. Okay, so here is a karindiria, a picture of a karindiria. You have the woman uh, there uh, and uh, it's very similar to Arturo Turo. So it's, um, it's interesting that it has persisted uh, across time. No? So they look all delicious. Look at the uh, vayan there. There is only rice. And then, of course, you have your water uh, coming from uh, a, uh, a jar. But with pandemic, we cannot have uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, drinking vessel now. No? But interesting. It's a very interesting picture of how the ordinary people lived during the 19th century. Now, so I will end by saying what were some insights I got on the women of Ermita. So I said, uh, women of Ermita were engaged in a wide range of occupations and the five leading uh, occupations of women in the Padron Vecindario del Pueblo de Ermita, año uh, uh, 1886 uh, up to uh, 1887, uh, were this, which I had previously discussed, costurera, cigarrera, bugadora, lavandera, and tindera. Women of Ermita were into occupations which required skills, like your costurera, cigarrera, and bugadora. Now, costureras and cigarreras were engaged in uh, the aforementioned occupations in their active years, 20 to 49, uh, uh, and uh, uh, others uh, would uh, be uh, 20 to 49 for the burdadoras, the lavanderas, and tinderas. Their active life uh, would start at age 20 and went beyond 60. In terms of status, there were as many married women, 415, as single women, 405. And widowed women constituted half of the mentioned figures. Uh, another insight was women of Ermita were all gainfully employed. There was the absence of the category, category of madre de casa or housewife. But we are sure that the women of Ermita were also housewives, showing clearly the double burden experienced by the Filipino women or the Filipina in the 19th century. I would end with this presentation with this trio of Tagalog girls on the street of Emita. That was how it was captioned, no? And so these are the uh, uh, girls, Tagalog girls. And I said, 
which of these girls would become a uh, costurera, a bordadora, a cigarera, a lavandera, and a tindera. So thank you very much for your for listening. Thank you, Professor Emeritus Kamagai. That was truly an insightful presentation on the rich role and lives of the women workforce in the streets of 19th century Ermita. Now, before we introduce our next speaker, we would like to note that the UP Manila Quincentennial Commemoration Organizing Committee, through the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, is still exploring more efficient ways on how e-certificates can be issued to the attendees of the webinars who have answered the online evaluation form. The e-certificates will be issued after the last installment of the five-part webinar series. The link to the online evaluation form can be found in the chat box for Zoom viewers and comment box for Facebook Live viewers. It is also available on the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs Facebook page. Moving forward, we invite Professor, Prof Professor Sharon Carinal once more to introduce our next speaker. Para sa ating uh, ikalawang tagapagsalita ngayong umaga, uh, ipapakilala ko po siya sa inyo ngayon. Ang ating ikalawang tagapagsalita ay punong arkitekto ng Campus Planning Development and Maintenance Office ng UP Manila. Ito po ang opisinang responsable sa lahat ng mga konstruksyon at infrastructure sa UP Manila. Ang ating pong panaungin ay nagtapos ng kanyang bachelor's at master's degree mula sa kolehiyo ng arkitektura sa UP Diliman. Sa kabuuan ay meron na siyang dalawampung taong karanasan bilang arkitekto at nakagawa na rin siya ng ilang papel na nailimbag sa akademikong journal katulad ng daylighting simulations, a case study of the University of the Philippines College of Architecture Library na lumabas sa journal na Mohon. Mohon, a journal of architecture, landscape architecture, and the designed environment. Ang isa niya pang pag-aaral ay may titulong solar power and historic buildings, a case study on building integrated photovoltaics for the facade lighting of old churches na pinondohan naman ng uh, NCCA at ginamit na programa ng pag-iilaw ng minor basilica of St. Michael of the Archangel sa Tayabas, Quezon. Ang nasabing simbahan ay kabilang sa mga heritage churches sa ating bansa at meron ng mahigit kumulang apat na daang taong kasaysayan. Ito ang unang-unang lumang simbahan sa Pilipinas na gumamit ng solar energy sa pagpapailaw ng kanyang pasal. Malugod ko pong pinapakilala sa inyo ang ating ikalawang tagapagsalita ngayong araw na magtatalakay ng paksang reimagining a corner of Ermita in Pinoar, Manila. Si Architect Rosalie Flores Bernardo. Uh, good, good morning po. Thank you, Prof. Karingal. I'm going to share my screen for the presentation. Good morning to our distinguished UP officials, the committee members, and our guests. My topic is Reimagining a Corner for Mita in Pre-War Manila. I will first start with extramuros and colonial placemaking, followed by the American tropical policies of public works, tropical hygiene, education, materials, and building technologies. And then we will move on to the examples and uh, translation of UP buildings as a result of the Manila planning architects. These are Daniel Burnham, Edgar Bourne, William Parsons, and our own Filipino architects. Intramuros, a port city patterned after the medieval city fortress with its moat and walls, was the center of power of the Spanish colonial authorities. This was a massive project, which was completed around 1590. 
This was made up of a 3,916 meter pentagonal perimeter wall from volcanic tuff and brick filled in with earth. The designer and supervisor was Leonardo Toriano, a military engineer. This area was reser reserved for the nobility and the clergy, while the trading and Indios remained outside the walls. So these methods guarantee the security of the Spanish colonial elites. Extramuros, which Nardo. means villages outside Nardo. the walls, Nardo. such as pueblos and Arab. Excuse me. about colonial place making. So natives rely mainly on good yeah, morning. Yeah. Uh spatial zones for designated function and and they organize them in accordance with several urbanizing programs. So an example of this is um Binondo as a trading center or Ermita as a residential district known for selling piña in Sanamay and uh, business, business district in Santa Cruz, among others. There is also a hierarchical settlement system wherein they demarcate the loci for domination and marginalization. This is the... Um, institution of a city center, which is at the entrance of Intramuros, uh, where there is a certain central plaza and where it is surrounded by the church and the offices, including that of the governor general. They also introduced building typologies and construction technology through colonial infrastructure. So building te typologies like the church and how it was built using stone, the Bahay na Bato for the residential houses of the elite to combat earthquakes. So this, this um, type of construction makes them different from the native houses of Nipa wood and bamboo houses. So this, these are sturdier and more permanent building materials. One of the earliest notable architecture in Ermita is the Manila Observatory. This is located in Calle Observatorio, which was later renamed after the Jesuit priest, Father Federico Faura. He conducted meteorolo meteorological studies leading to the invention of the Faura barometer, which indicated the proximity and intensity of typhoons, which was very important for the safety of the city and the seafarers. The new building in Ermita was inaugurated in 1886, and in 1894, a separate building for astronomy was built with two towers of 10 meters diameter and 14 meters high. In one of them, a rotating dome was installed to house the equatorial telescope. The observatory was made of stone and steel. So this is the telescope, and this is the picture of the Faura barometer. You can see that the surrounding area of Ermita were mostly farmlands and permanent structures were, of, were that of churches. This is the Calle Padre Faura and uh, this is the site for the Manila Observatory. The American period brought about a bigger change in the urban fabric of Manila. When the, nine, the 1898 Treaty of Paris was signed, turning over Manila to the Americans, the military government took over the city. Their benevolent assimilation policy, as described in a proclamation by U.S. President William McKinley on December 21, 1898, implementing a civilizing scheme of education, upliftment, and Christianization of the Filipinos. And along with this, intended political power are supported with infrastructure development. One of the three colonial policies is focused on public works. The Philippine Commission's first act on September 12, 1900, was the appropriation of 1 million US dollars for the construction of roads and bridges to open up the new territory. Labor was provided by the natives equivalent to five days per year or the payment equivalent to the cost of labor. 
The urban interventions were started such as mapping and construction of new city streets, which also puts the walled city of Intramuros under evaluation and if still relevant to the plans of the city. The demolition of the walls garnered so much attention that President Roosevelt asked the landscape architect D.R. Slaughter to visit and inspect. Eventually, they retained the walls to be made as a park which is also an attempt to show loyalty to the inhabitants of Manila. Aside from Intramuros, they also envisioned lavish urban spaces. Public spaces were developed and they also improved the bayside by land rec rec reclamation for Luneta and Dewey Boulevard. Infrastructure is also developed per building type. There is a prescribed architectural style, including materials and methodologies for specific buildings. Roads and pavements are also improved to accommodate vehicular traffic. Gates in Intramuros are widened so as not to cause traffic. So this is a picture how the gates of Intramuros were widened to accom accommodate vehicles. Ports are provided with breakwater and dredging of harbor areas. So these dredged materials are then used to reclaim 60 hectares of land in Armita and Malate. This is a picture of how the esteros were being cleaned by dredging. So canals and esteros were cleaned and depth has been increased around 2 meters for better navigation. So this is an example of an estero where water um, transportation has remained active during the American period. So by 1903, 107 kilometers of esteros were navigable. Bridges have been upgraded for vehicles and not just pedestrians and were made by using sturdier steel. So this is an example of um, steel con construction in bridges. Uh, this is uh, the Quezon Bridge. They also tried to provide identification, demarcation, and delineation of the urban space by street naming to easily do surveillance. Parcelization of the lots are sold to selected Americans, such as Henry M. Jones, who sold lots for one to two pesos per square meter after reclamation of the swampy areas. Um, aside from modern urban facilities, public services were also upgraded. Manila uses 2 billion gallons of water that came from Maritina River, and in 1908, this was supported by the Arriedo Waterworks, producing 22 million gallons. Artesian wells were also popular for residential areas in 1906. Sewer lines were also laid so that buildings may connect to the pipes that lead to the pumping stations discharging sewage to the bay. There is also a system of canals for storm water drainage. So all of these measures are mainly to prevent diseases. There was available electricity during the Spanish period from the Compañía La Electricista in 1892 for city lighting and private use. Um, and by 1902, this was already a 1,000 horsepower electric plant. By January 30, 1906, the Philippine Commission passed an act granting permission to Manila Electric Railroad and Light Company or Meralco for the construction of railway tracks in the city. The franchise was awarded to Charles Swift to construct, maintain, and operate an electric railway and an electric light heat and power system. They also upgraded electrical lines and replaced old bulbs, which were supported by the fire and police department because most of the uh, cause of fires during this time are from um, candles. So the franchise that was awarded to Meralco was for 50 years with a 2.5% tax to the government. The telephone and telegraph system was franchised to the Philippine Islands Telephone and Telegraph Company to connect to the provinces, cities, and municipalities. The 2% of the earnings were provided to the insular government. The transportation during the Spanish occupation was mostly horse-drawn and tramvias. The Americans upgraded the transportation by using public cabs, which charges 15 to 20 cents per trip 
and the extension of the railway lines. The second policy is for widespread to tropical hygiene. The Americans consider the natives as unsanitary and they try to intervene with practices to cleanse the environment. So they intervene with the Filipinos' toilets, toilet practices, food handling, dietary customs, very practices. So this uh, was discussed greatly in Dr. Victor Heiser's An American Doctor's Odyssey. So they started cleansing the environment to eliminate biological threats and started with filling the moats surrounding intramuros walls with earth to prevent the breeding of malaria causing mosquitoes. So they think that Filipinos require control and medical reformation to sanitary methods. Some of the actions that they took was to rebuild domestic architecture and markets using the more hygienic concrete. They executed routine quarantines, quarantines for suspected epidemic-stricken communities, petrolized stagnant waters to eliminate the breeding places of mosquitoes, and even suppressed the unsanitary fiestas to prevent spreading of diseases. Although these methods are um, technically good, the execution was insensitive to the Filipino culture. The Philippine Medical School, the Bureau of Science, and the Philippine General Hospital have been instrumental in addressing a vari variety of epidemics in the city. Dr. Paul Freer, as Dean of the Philippine Medical School from 1907 to 1912, and supervised the setting up of the lab, lab facilities in the Bureau of Science in 1901, he also assisted in planning the PGH. He conducted studies for cholera, dysentery, and smallpox, and was able to develop vaccines against smallpox in the Bureau of Science. Dr. Fierce's work were continued with his fellow doctors, and eventually the schools for pharmacy, dentistry, veterinary medicine, and the Graduate School of Tropical Medicine and Public Health were established. So all of these facilities uh, was... Uh, instrumental in the clinical approach to health um, because of the integration of the laboratory, the hospital, and the school. So here's an example of the Ermita neighborhood where the residences are made out of uh, bamboo, nipa, and touch. These materials are very difficult to clean. So um, I would just like to show you how one of the images uh, showing how this infection was executed by the Board of Health. The architectural products from sanitation are the creation of guidelines containing the plagues and infectious diseases, mostly within the community, the introduction of the toilet in 1902 by pale system or cobeta. Uh, this is the drawing of a standard cobeta with a pail underneath. So this is um, picked up daily by the Bureau of Health. The introduction of the sanitary barrios in 1908. This is a drawing of a sanitary barrio where there is a common public toilet to be shared by the residences. And also the modernization of the Filipino house or chalet in 1912. So this is the modern Bahay Kubo. And they also introduced the sanitary public markets like uh, this one where they used concrete to create a stable and cleaner market. The third policy is education. Americans admit that most of the Tagalogs are literate when they arrived in the Philippines due to the education system that was provided by the Spaniards. However, the Americans began to restructure the education system to conform to the American values and ideals. So I tabulated the differences in the Spanish and American system of education here, where uh, one of the thrust of the American system was to create an, an, a university belt 
uh, at the south of the Pasig River, including the University of the Philippines in Ermita. So it was also in 1912 where the Bureau of Public Works standardized the schoolhouses called Gabaldon Schoolhouse. So this is an example of a typical Gabaldon Schoolhouse um, using ferro-concrete with the vernacular style. So this, these were used to build the modern public schools throughout the Philippines. Part of the education reform was the creation of the University of the Philippines in 1908. It was founded by Act Number 1870 of the First Philippine Legislature on June 18, 1908, for the purpose of providing advanced instruction in liter literature, philosophy, the sciences, the arts, and to give professional and technical writing. With the recommendation of the Public of Instruction Secretary W. Morgan Schuster, Government, Governor General James F. Smith chose the 10-hectare lot between Calle Isaacperal and Padre Paura as the site for the University of the Philippines, which was to be shared with the already reserved site for the Philippine Medical School and PGH. So this was the this this is a picture of the exposition grounds where Calle de la Heran will be the location of the Philippine Medical School and the Bureau of Science Building and also PGH. So they identified uh, this 10 hectare lot as the site for the University of the Philippines. According to Murray Bartlett, the first president of UP, the university was for the Filipino and that we are expected to provide unselfish service for the good of our country and fellow men. It was also mentioned by Manuel Quezon that the creation of UP was one of the first acts of the Philippine Assembly and that the budget was from the Philippine Treasury. Our goal was to become patriotic Filipino citizens and seek our own destiny separate from the Americans. The following um, table shows the first colleges for university. As you can see, most of these started using facilities around Manila, such as residential houses or other schools, while the buildings were being designed and constructed. Only the College of PetMed was found in LB or Los Banos Laguna, um, but most of them are scattered within Manila. So here's the typical residence from the O'Brien family used by the College of Engineering. Aside from the three policies initially mentioned, the Americans brought change by the introduction of modern building materials that enabled taller and larger structures, complex forms, and replicability of ornamentation. The primary materials were steel, reinforced concrete, and concrete hollow blocks. Concrete is a highly plastic material that can be used and formed in a variety of ways in the creation of structural members up to the finer details of ornamentation. Reinforced concrete is the combination of concrete and steel. Steel with a high tensile strength matches concrete's high compressive strength, and uh, this results in uh, creating taller buildings with longer spans and greater op openings. Concrete hollow blocks or CHB is a variation created by means of a machine that molds rectangular blocks with hollow interiors. This is an economical way for the construction of walls that we still use today. Previously shown was an advertisement of the CHB hand tamping machine where the Philippines is just one of the markets. Prefabricated or precast concrete are also very integral to the neoclassical components like this one. Decorative features such as the ionic capital for the columns were produced in multiples and concrete casting have made this process easier. Use of steel was for the engineering requirements of bridges and towers as seen in the development of the ports. Architectural materials such as clay tiles, terrazzo, and veneers are architectural finishes that provide better looking surfaces. 
But before moving on to the effects of policies in the architecture of Ermita, it is important to note that there was a survey of Philippine architecture first architectural historian Montgomery Schreiler written in the Ar architectural record. He stated that the Spanish mode of building fits the requirement of the Spanish colonies better than the American mode of building. He also said that the thin walls impermeable to heat the long, dark, open arcades along which one may make his way in the shade, these features of the architecture of the peninsula, which are equally appropriate, which are even more appropriate in the tropical heat of Cuba and Luzon. These necessary features are susceptible of a most attractive architectural expression. So this con contextual approach of uh, trop is tropical and congruous with the architectural precedents set by Spain and that the architectural style moves to encourage continuity instead of the complete eradication of the past. These um, suggestions were consistent with the building design plans by the following Manila architects that will be discussed in the next slide. The bureau that was in charge of infrastructure development and implementation took on many reorganizations, but it was initially the Bureau of Architecture and Construction. On May 11, 1901, there was a request to appoint a competent architect to head the Bureau of Architecture to be created by the Commission. And by October 18, 1901, the Philippine Commission Act 268 founded the Bureau of Architecture and Construction of Public Buildings under the Department of Public Instruction. It is mandated to design, construct, repair, and supervise all public buildings that belong to the insular government or proposed structures detailed by the civil government. The role of the chief architect was filled by Edgar Ketchum Bourne. He was tasked to make all the necessary plans, specifications, for construction and repair of public buildings and to send these plans and specifications with estimated cost through the Secretary of Public Instruction to the civil governor for his approval. And when approved, this shall be presented to the commission to get the appropriation for execution. He introduced the building types for the new architecture of public buildings such as government buildings, schools, and hospitals and his preferred style is Mission Revival. This was popular during the 1890s in the American Southwest. The essential elements are clay, roof tiles, adobe, concrete, stucco, with gables, arches, and towers for the building forms. The reason, the reason for this style is uh, the association of the Philippines as a Spanish colony and that we supposedly share the same Hispanic traditions with the American Southwest. So the Spanish revival were integrated with vernacular forms and uh, they were consistent to solar and heat resistive architecture. As mentioned, here are the stylistic elements which I will identify in the next building as a perfect example. So this is the government laboratory building or the Bureau of Science building and was founded under the Philippine Commission Act Number no. 156 on July 1, 1901. The, the building was finished in 1904, which consisted of biological and chemical laboratory pavilions. This was the architectural set piece for the 24-acre old exposition site. The materials are masonry or blocks joined by lime and cement mortar smoothly plastered by hand. The structural system was a new method of solid poured concrete foundation as a system to address the marshy area in Ermita as an air early slope protection system. The central portal entrance and the 10 feet wide corridors with openings at both ends make it responsive to the tropical climate because of cross ventilation. The floors are also finished with asphaltic materials impervious to acids because this is a laboratory building. So let us check the features of the Bureau of Science building in relation to the stylus elements of Mission Revival. So we have the curvilinear 
parapeted or scalloped roof lines here, um, round arched entrances and canopies, um, white or slightly tinted smooth plastered walls, uh, as seen here, and then the pyramidal terracotta tiled roof, the exposed roof arches, the arched arcades and corridors, and the two dominant mirador towers. In keeping with the sanitation policy, Born also designed hospitals using the pavilion scheme for maximum cross ventilation. He also prepared the plans for the unbuilt Manila General Hospital. This is a 1,500 bed hospital composed of four one story pavilions zoned for the combined maternity and women's ward, the general and surgical ward, gen general medical ward and the ward for native men and women. These were connected to a two-story building, housing the administration offices, operating room, emergency ward, attendance quarters, and a one-story kitchen and a dining room extension. This has the same mission revival aesthetics by the government laboratory. Although the perspective is not clear, there is a main central st structure and with, which has ornate parapets in the middle. The facade design has cylindrical volumes with a dome at the side, a side entrance. The cylindrical drums were sandwiched between two towers with the pyramidal style tile roof. The cost is about 240,000 pesos, but due to lack of funds, this was temporarily shelved and turned over to William Parsons. After Edward Bourne, there was a reorganization of the Bureau and the Bureau of Architecture and Construction of Public Buildings, the Bureau of Engineering and Construction of Public Works were merged to the Bureau of Public Works by the Philippine Commission Act of 1407 in October 26, 1905. This is called the Reorganization Act. The Bureau of Public Works was the principal implementing agency to interpret and execute the approved vision for Manila and Baguio by the U.S. Congress on June 20, 1906. This was designed by Daniel H. Burnham, who was known for the City Beautiful Movement. This aims to transform cities to beautiful, orderly, healthy, and efficient in, in reliance to the view arts formalism. The urban elements are the civic core, the wide radial avenues, the landscape, promenades, and panoramic views with neoclassicism as the architectural style. So this map is the report and the submission of Daniel Burnham to the U.S. Congress that was approved. Here's a blow up, blow up of the area where the majority of changes can be seen for Manila. There is an establishment of a central civic core with streets radiating from it, the purpose of which is to spread the traffic to different parts of the area. It is also important that, that the cleaning and development of canals and esteros are integrated in the plan for additional routes for transportation. Um, there is also the construction of the Bayshore Boulevard from Manila to Cavite through land reclamation. The provision of zones for major public facilities such as schools and hospitals are all incorporated here in the plan and um, mostly are connected here in the right side of the plaza. Development of summer resorts near the capital, which is in Baguio. So this idea of a civic core with urban parks is similar to the Chicago Columbian Exposition of 1893 and Washington, D.C. The architect who Daniel Burnham chose to implement his design was William Edward Parsons. In September 20, 1905, Governor William Cameron Forbes authorized Parsons to head the planning and development of the political and physical infrastructure. 
his tasks were to be in charge of the preparation of designs for all public buildings and monuments, the formulation of guidelines, and most importantly, interpret Burnham's preliminary plans for Manila and Baguio through the preparation of the architectural details. In short, the Burnham Plan was a law which Parsons must strictly follow. His major contributions were the improvement of the quality of construction materials and techniques through the importation of building technologies from the U.S. and the adoption of the standardized plan and modular systems for building types to bring down the cost. He used reinforced concrete as a staple material for all public buildings to coincide with the sanitation policies of easy cleaning and disinfection. He discontinued the use of organ pine because of termite attacks and used endemic hardwood instead. One of his most outstanding work is the Philippine General Hospital in 1910. It was meant to meet the expanding demand for medical services of the city's growing population and to replace the civil hospital. This was started by Bourne and continued by Parsons, who retained the pavilion layout as initially designed. This started with the 350 beds located in several pavilions so constructed as to make them airy and well-lit, and the wards were so designed to suit the warm climate. The building is notable for the clear circulation network, the flexibility for expansion, and excellent ventilation and lighting provided by the high ceiling and the interconnecting open walkways. The materials used are reinforced concrete with an angled roof. The floors are two stories with service and medical wings connected by arched corridors and pavilions. Here are the pictures for the interior courtyard and the interiors where you can see the large windows and spacious hallways. The efficiency of the cross ventilation stemmed from the idea that diseases were formerly believed to be caused by foul odor or vaporous exhalation. So better circulation can address and dissipate this, these airborne viruses and bacteria. So PGH was used as a template for other American army hospitals in other tropical territories such as Panama. The Philippine Medical School and Surgery was built in 1910 to produce graduates for health and sanitation. The school was established by law in 1905 but was able to transfer to the UP campus only on June 1, 1910. The architectural style is the simplified neoclassic style in a rectangular block layout with large windows, high ceiling for lighting, and cross ventilation with the pyramidal roof. The precast ornaments are simple and muted as compared to the mission revival style of Parsons' earlier buildings. Here's a picture from the back, also featuring the tennis courts by the 1916 Philippine The first to be built on the campus grounds on Padre Faura is the University Hall in 1913. The three-story structure costs about 250,000 pesos, measured 58.35 meters long by 5.8 meters wide. The foundation works were made up of chain footings with reinforced concrete. Dwarf walls supported the frame of the first floor and distributed the load of the frame on the footing. You can still see the dwarf wall when you visit the, these buildings um, in Padre Faura. The style changed from Mission Revival to a more ornate, precast, neoclassic theme. It still has large windows, colonnades, and eaves for shading against the harsh sunlight, and the hallways still open at both ends for maximum cross ventilation. Um, the form, as you see today, has not been altered too much and still retains the exterior 10 ionic columns along Padre Faura and 6 ionic columns on both lateral faces of the building. The columns were 86 cm in diameter at the base and tapers to 74 cm at the top. These columns were up to 9.6 meters high from the base of the pedestal to the crown of the cap. There are also anthropomorphic sculptures that depict ideas for learning, although the features resemble 
foreign facial features. So this is an example of sculptures um, introduced or provided at the entrance for um, representing learning and uh, guidance. So this, these are the Rizal Hall and the University Hall. So this is the University Hall and the Rizal Hall, which is uh, currently being occupied by the College of Arts and Sciences. The appointment of Francis Burton Harrison as the Governor General in 1913 started the Filipinization of the bureaucracy. The enactment of the Jones Law or the Philippine Autonomy Act in 1917 has been beneficial to the Filipinos as they take, as they take on more roles in the government. As early as 1908, selected Filipinos were made as scholars to study in the U.S. These men are called the pensionados and eventually took on the responsibility of the architects in the Bureau of Public Works. When Parsons resigned, Antonio M. Toledo, who was his draftsman, assumed the role of implementing the designs for the UP Manila campus, including the College of Medicine Annex and the University Library. The succeeding slides show the development of the university and the buildings designed by the pensionado architects. Between 1924 and 1925, under Rafael Palmas, the UP president, the university completed the construction of the swimming pool, a grandstand, and minor buildings to house facilities for the College of Engineering, College of Medicine, and the Department of Military Science. The quadrangle of the College of Liberal Arts in front of the University Hall was completed in 1926. So here's the picture of the athletic field and quadrangle um, in the Padre Faura site taken by the 1926 Filipinensian um, uh, pamphlet. Here's the engineering building, which is now used by the Court of Appeals today. The design is still consistent with a three-story neoclassical design in a rectangular layout. So here is the picture of the interiors with the engineering students at work. Similar in style and layout with four columns at the front are Salcedo Hall in 1927 and Lyra Hall in 1931. These buildings are mirror images and connected to form part of the medic medicine and surgery building. Um, these reflect also the aesthetics of view arts with uh, rectangular plan, neoclassical elements, high ceiling, and large opening of windows. The university library was designed by Antonio M. Toledo, who was a draftsman under William Parsons. In 1915, he was promoted to superintendent architect and in 1938 became the consulting architect until 1954. He's an expert in neoclassical and monumental architecture, having learned from William Parsons himself and his training abroad. His notable works in Manila are the University Library, Department of Finance Building, and the Manila City, Manila City Hall. The facade, as seen here, is seamlessly, seamlessly integrated to the University Hall and Rizal Hall. Also given that Toledo was the architect for the University Library, it may also be that he is also the architect for the Salcedo, Lara, and the engineering building. However, um, I am unable to find any official record about this. The nurse's home in PGH was designed by Tomas Bautista Mapua, who was the first registered architect in the Philippines. He became the supervising architect from 1918 to 1927 and established the Mapua Institute of Technology in 1925. The design of the nurse's home is based on the Renaissance style. The facade is symmetrically divided into three zones by variances in the openings. The first level has the Florentine arcaded entry. The second has the rectangular windows with cornices at the top and a balustraded balcony with arches at the top. The entrance is flanked by 
decorative Corinthian columns crowned by statues. Here's a picture of the nurse's home today, which is uh, which you can still see the details of um, delicate architecture and, and molding, including the Corinthian column and the sculptures at the top. The last jewel to complete the buildings in Padre Faura is the construction of the Villamore Hall in 1933, which is designed by the prolific architect Juan Aureliano. He was considered as the most creative among the first generation of Filipino architects, probably due to his sensibilities as a painter and an architect. This is especially useful in designing the Villamore Hall intended for the School of Fine Arts and Conservatory of Music. The building is rectangular in plan with a main portal on the north end close to Taft Avenue. It has a recessed portico with an arch supported by columns. The ornamentation is inspired by the Renaissance with two sculpted music muses at the entrance. One carried a lyre and the other one carried a palette and brush to represent music and fine arts. His notable works are the Legislative Building, now the National Museum, Jones Bridge, the Manila Post Office, Metropolitan Theater, Rizal Memorial Stadium, and also Benitez and Malcolm Hall in UP Diliman. Although he excels in the classical style, he was able to translate his nationalist ideology through ornamentation and building forms. His later buildings eventually became a precursor to modern international style. So in conclusion, I can say that architecture is an effective tool that can be used to implement policies for colonization. So this can be seen in the Spanish and the American period where they um, envisioned the, the city through architecture and how they implemented sanitation for the Americans through the use of materials and, and the designs of their buildings as simple so that um, it's easier to maintain and to clean. So next is that um, Ermita as an Arabal or suburb was known initially as a res residential zone, but eventually this transformed to an integral part of the political agenda because of the availability of the space and the strategic location along the shoreline. And um, based on this um, timeline, through the different periods, the architectural style used by the architects can provide um, a sense of a series of events that can be used as a living museum for remembering our past. Uh, the picture here is uh, from John Tuwell's site, taken in 1939. This is the Padre Faura site showing the buildings, the UP buildings, the William Moore Hall, Rizal Hall, the University Library, and the University Hall. You can also see the College of Engineering or the Court of Appeals, the Grandstand, and the Quadrangle. Thank you. And again, good morning. Thank you so much, Architect Flores Bernardo, for showing a reimagined picture of Ermita, a place that is dear and familiar to many of us here today for taking us on an enlightening journey with your presentation. Indeed, having an architectural perspective and analyzing our history proves that the infrastructures which were once built in our land, and even the ones that remain upright today, did not just spectate, but also reflect the significant changes brought by the colonial policies in the life of the Philippines. May we invite Professor Karingal once more to introduce our third and last speaker. Ang ating ikatatlong tagapagsalita ay Professor Five at Program Coordinator ng DA Philippine Arts sa programang Cultural Heritage and Arts Management ng UP Manila. 
Siya ay nagtapos ng BA Humanities, BMED, at Doctorate sa Philippine Studies sa UP Liman. Siya ay isang UP Centennial at one UP Professor, Professorial Chair Awardee at regular na miyembro ng UP Research Ethics Board. Kamakailan ay ginawaran siya bilang university artist sa pagkilala ng kanyang mahalagang ambag sa malikhaing pagkasaliksik, paglalathala, at pagkataguyod ng cultural heritage. Siya ay nanungkulan din bilang direktor ng Office of Student Affairs, UP Manila, mula 2011 hanggang 2013. Kasama sa kanyang interes sa pananaliksik ang sining ng Timog Silangang Asya, antropolohiya ng sining, at medical anthropology. Ang mga paksang ito rin ang naging sentro ng kanyang mga naisulat na ipresenta sa lokal at international na konferensya at na ilathala bilang journal article o kabanata ng libro. Ang kanyang pinakabagong publikasyon ay kabanata sa aklat na Scopus Index na may titulong Religious Tourism in Asia, Tradition and Change Through Case Studies. Na ilathala din sa Calle Paura Journal ang kanyang artikulong Calle Paura, Cultural Heritage Amidst Conflict in Ermita, Manila. At isa pang artikulo na lumabas naman sa Philippine Journal of Health Research and Development noong 2018 na pinamagatang The Ibaloy of Benguet as Active Agents in Health Negotiations. Matapos ang Marawi Siege, pinangunahan at pinasinayaan niya noong 2017 ang konferensyang may titulong The Lost and Retrieve, Cultural Heritage and Its Conflict. Sa kasalukuyan, siya ang direktor ng taunang Flores de Mayo Festivals and Conferences ng Paura Project na ipinapagdiwang sa buwan ng Mayo. Malugod ko pong pinapakilala sa inyo ang ating katatlong tagapagsalita na magtatalakay ng paksang Proclaiming the Unsung, the Faura Project and Heritage Advocacy in Ermita, si Dr. Hani Libertin at Shansar Labor. Okay, uh, magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Uh, nagpapasalamat po ako sa UP Manila Queen Centennial Commemoration Committee sa pag sa akin na ibahagi ang The Fara Project. So let me just uh, share my screen. Ay, can I? Yan, okay, I'll just share my screen. I do this. Yes, yes. Yeah, slide share. Okay, the Fabra Project and Heritage Advocacies in Ermita. Okay, so uh, the presence of a landmark that represents Ermita in the 1598 map of Peter van der Kier's Insula Filipine indicates the importance given to the site where the image of the Nuestra Senora de Guia was found in 1571. So with the construction of a shrine in the area, sorry, uh, of what eventually was to be known by its name, La Ermita, it became the residence of a community which continuously grew in number and which in turn demanded a continuous development that only ceased after the destruction of Manila at the end of Second World War. So the relevance of the area where the University of the Philippines Manila lie is the very subject of uh, the advocacy of the FAURA project, an organization of alumni, faculty, current students, and friends of UP Manila that is bound by a common cause, which is to revive, revitalize, and sustain the rich cultural and historical heritage of Ermita particularly along Faura Street and its environs. I shall be presenting to you today some maps which trace the continuous importance of Ermita through time and also space since we know that the, that the geographical terrain of Ermita has changed due to continuous reclamation of land. So these maps are most relevant to the prehistory of the Faura project as the latter started with the regular conduct of heritage trails inspired by maps old and new. The said trails had a number of versions as these targeted particular audiences, each one meant to highlight historical and cultural heritage that can be most appreciated by different age groups and academic background. 
An offshoot of these heritage trails are the annual Flores de Mayo festivals, which started in 2018. No? So week-long celebration of heritage, both tangible and intangible, along the street which it, cha which it champions. So the first slides I will be showing you uh, will come from this book. No? It's a 300 years of Philippine maps published by the Metropolitan Museum of Manila for an exhibit which showcased maps published from 1598 to 1898, no? which makes 300 years. So, so this is the Petrus Kerus 1598 Insula Filipina map published in Amsterdam. So this small map is historic for being the first map of the Philippines already within its, its established historical borders. What may be more relevant though in my presentation is the presence of two forts. Um, let me, yes, if you see my arrow, yeah, fort one, fort two, yes. No? Um, and right between this is a marker in the form of a cross. There. Uh, so this marker is slightly nearer to the fort on the right. Now we said that Petrus Kiris map is dated 1598. So by that year, we know that there were indeed two forts in the area. No? So Fort Santiago, no? which became the main port of the spice trade to the Americas and Europe for three centuries, and Fort San Abad, built in 1584. And we know that also uh, before the publication of that map, the Nuestra Señora de Guía, the image, no? was also found no? in um, according to the late 17th century manuscript, Anades Ecclesiasticos de Filipinas, the image was found after the taking of Manila from Raja Sulaiman. Right? After a hard and bloody battle, Legazpi entered the magnificent city of Manila with its 4,000 beautiful houses on May 19, 1571. So a soldier walking along the shore of Manila Bay found the image of the Nessa Senora de Guia among the center foliage of a pandan tree. So this was indeed possible since the land fronting it was not yet reclaimed. No? So according to local lore, the natives built a quaint wooden temple for the image where it was transferred a little beyond the place where it was originally found. So historians trying to establish the origin of this image have come up with the theory that it was brought to the Philippines together with the Santo Nino de Cebu by Ferdinand Magellan in 1521 and was given to the rulers of Manila as a present by the rulers of Cebu. Uh, Dr. Kamagay also said earlier that Fray Juan de la Concepcion in his work Historia General, General de Filipinas suspects that the image came from India which had been visited by the Apostle Thomas. And in an article of Ambet Ocampo um, in Philippine Inquirer in 2014, he recounts that a Portuguese, Portuguese historian in the 1970s informed his Filipino colleagues that the Ermita image in Manila resembles another Nuesta Senora de Guia in a church also called La Ermita overlooking Macau. And that the title Nuesta Senora de Guia is not Spanish, but Portuguese in origin. <laughs> so Ocampo added that was an image in fact brought to, the, to Manila by Portuguese missionaries before Legazpi arrived in 1571. It has also been proposed by other historians that the image carved from Molave with distinct orient oriental rather than Western features was made by pre-Spanish Filipinos or perhaps a Chinese artisan who venerated it as an idol, a lika, or perhaps a duwata. In a paper I presented in the opening program of the third Flores de Mayo Festival with a theme celebrating 500 years of heritage with local flora, just like last week, I said that aside from the fact that this image predates the arrival of Legazpi in 1571, the place of the Nuestra Señora de Guía in the quincentenary is confirmed by the narratives of local flora that surrounds it. First, the vitex par the flora or the Molabe tree, um, which the image is made up of, no, is endemic to the region of Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Secondly, the Pandanus amarili folius, commonly known as pandan, likewise is a plant that is grown widely throughout Southeast Asia. Due to the limitation of time in that conference, I did get to say, uh, to state uh, that the face and hands of the sculpture 
of the image is made out of nara, ter terocarpus indicus, no? a species of terocarpus, which is native to the Philippines. It was also declared the national tree of the Philippines in 1934 through proclamation number 652. It is certain then that the medium of the sculpted image of the Nuestra Señora de Guía is of Asian origin and that it predates 450 years. The Francois uh, Valentin Dodrex 1724 map of the Stad Manila or the city of Manila show more clearly the site of the shrine of Ermita between Fort Santiago and Fort Abad. So this is, okay, this is uh, the shrine. Okay. The Duque de Almodovar 1787 plan de Manila, Subaya y Puerto de Cavite is on the other hand, the earliest map in the exhibit which shows the word Ermita actually printed. Uh, there you go. <laughs> In the 1898 Plano de Manila, uh, okay. uh, Plano de Manila is Arabales. We see here the Observatorio and the Escuela de Agricultura, where the University of the Philippines will stand a decade after. 1929 map of the city of Manila. We see here the university campus. We see that the, the continuous development of Ermita only ceased after the destruction of Manila at the end of World War, of the Second World War. Practically everything was at a standstill then, except for PGH, which continued to address the needs of the sick and the wounded, as well as UP Manila, which still managed to conduct classes in makeshift classrooms. After the war, Ermita slowly resurfaced, but this time as a commercial center. Up until now, with the increasing number of high-rise towers for more commercial establishments and offices, as well as condominiums for the growing number of people who either study or work in the area. Another mark of the modern is the application of constructive reuse on heritage buildings. Of course, the presence of the constituent unit of the University of the Philippines and the Philippine General Hospital with the National Institute of Health largely contributed as well to its relevance. For these reasons, this part of Ermita remained always accessible to public transportation. Padre Fauda Street can be reached via light rail transits, buses, jeepneys, of course, taxis, FX, electric tricycles, and even pedicabs. So public vehicles run through as well in front and behind the shrine of the Mesa Senora de Guia. So Ermita Church continued to remain then or to remain accessible to the public and factored in to maintain its importance. It remains to be a frequent part of Visita Iglesia routes during Holy Week. The Nesa Senora de Guia continually is bestowed, bestowed then with new garments. Many of this can be seen uh, displayed inside the Camarin at the end or at the back of the shrine. And just last month, um, she was given a new set of clothing designed by no less than Barge Ramos, a fashion designer known for his many iterations, iterations of the Barong Tagalog. For the Nuestra Senora de Guia's garment, he used piña cloth and embroidered it with ilang-ilang blossoms and pandan leaves. We also see cut bead crystals on the garment. So the relevance of place of both the University of the Philippines Manila and its environs, Ermita, is the very subject of the advocacy of the FAURA project as it seeks to revive, revitalize, and sustain the rich cultural and historical heritage of Ermita, particularly along pa um, Padre FAURA Street no? and its environs. Besides its historical and geographical significance, Ermita has managed to maintain a rich cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible. A few of these are indeed visible and well manifest and just have to be promoted. Some are latent and in need of revival through research. Others basically just need to be sustained through conservation. The FAURA project gets to address all three objectives, but I, uh, and I have shown you earlier how 
import the importance of place can really feed to the study of maps and their analysis. I will be presenting next just two more projects or undertakings due to the limitation of time. So just the, um, I'll, I'm referring to the Flores de Mayo festivals and the heritage trails. So first the maps and heritage trails. No? So the maps presented earlier are testaments to the importance of Ermita's place. They are indeed tangible proof of heritage of Ermita as they trace its continuous significance through time and also geographical space. So these maps too, though, are what inspired the initial offerings of the Faura project, the Cali Faura heritage trails, heritage trails, no? scripts of varied pathways in the Ermita area that showcase different itineraries and narratives. The first was just the basic trail that traced key heritage sites along Padre Faura Street uh, from Paco Park and Cemetery to Manila Bay, just a straight, uh, just along the street itself. No? So Manila Bay at the other end. So the Paco Park and Cemetery was uh, open to the public in 1822 as a burial ground for victims of the Asiatic cholera pandemic in 1817 and to 1824. The Paco Park and Cemetery became resting place of the Spanish High Society in the late 1800s. Here too was um, our national hero, Dr. Jose Rizal was interred after his execution in Bagum Bagumbayan. And it was the final resting place of the three Filipino martyrs and priests Jose Burgos, Mario, Mario Gomez, and Jacinto Zamora. There. So on the right is the rest is the Gomburza monument. At the other end of the street is Manila Bay. And between the two are the campus, uh, are the campus of the University of the Philippines, Manila, with its heritage buildings and the platform for one of the Ateneo Bells, which stands at the site of the former Faura Observatory. That's where Robinson's Ermita now stands. So you would see that at the entrance of Robinson's Ermita. Another trail was a short linear chronology of Philippine history. From Manila Bay, we had a discussion of pre-Hispanic terrain of Ermita, marked by a web of esteros, to the shrine of Admesa Senora de Guia, this is the Nessa Senora de Guia, which marked the beginning of the Span Spanish contact in the Philippines or in Manila, at least in the Ermita area, to the site of the former observatory. So you walk from, where's my arrow? Oh, there. So you walk from the observatory to, uh, from the shrine to the observatorio. So which marks the last decades of Spanish rule to the UP grounds. No? Uh, formerly the Escuela de Agricultura. Uh, so the UP grounds, which stands testament to the promotion of public health, as well as a public and secular university system. So the itinerary ends with the UP Manila Museum of the History of Ideas, the former UP infirmary turned college of dentistry, subjected to constructive reuse and turned into a contemporary museum in terms of content and form. Beside it, of course, are the high-rise malls and condominiums, pointing as well to the modern Philippine era. So it was actually a, tra a, a trail no, which started with the pre-Hispanic to the modern. So heritage trail scripts have also been prepared for particular groups, for children and for older groups, no, high school and college students, and also for local and foreign tourists. These are initially conducted by the members of the Fauda Project, who have had experience in museum work. UP students were later trained to conduct this. Collaboration were also carried out with UP Manila professors. Street productions have also been carried out. There was a day wherein one would see Padre Federico Faura walking along the street that was named after him. And an amazing race production took place from Paco Park to the PGH grounds with the UP oblation as the ultimate pit stop. Since most of the flora or since most of the fora or symposia are not accessible to passersby, we thought of organizing once a forum on heritage conservation in a venue that provided direct access from the street. 
even for anyone just passing by. So we had one at the Girl Scout Auditorium along Padre Fowle Street in 2014. So two speakers were invited for the half-day event. One from the National Museum who spoke on heritage conservation. The other, uh, the other one was Dr. Rafael Bondo who spoke of uh, heritage buildings in UP Manila. And among the participants in the said forum was the former vice mayor of Manila, Isco Moreno. You see him here, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, who was our guest of honor and who vouched to make heritage conservation part of his continuing advocacy. I think it was providential that he had to attend our forum in behalf of the city mayor at the time. Despite the variety of heritage trails that have been concept conceptualized and conducted along the street, study and analysis of maps and their application continue. Processions during May festivals, uh, during May festivals organized by Anita Church are, are being tracked for the purpose of similar street gatherings, partly to study traffic flow, partly to monitor community participation. Maps indicating flood hazards are also monitored. And this makes the scheduling of our flagship project, the Flores de Mayo festivals on the month of May, most ideal as this is not flood prone. To the map provided by the Intramuros administration for their suggested tour routes, the FAWRA project responds with a map of a suggested heritage trail that links the Intramuros route to the Padre Faura street. And since heritage trails are no, easily, are no longer easily accessed or are not easily accessed in this time of pandemic, we are developing heritage trails that can be accessed online. Um, if, uh, if you press uh, Hispanic, we're supposed to see how Padre Faura looked like during the time. If you press American and contemporary, let us just go down. Yes. So this is what would, I don't see my, I don't see my arrow right there. So this is what you would see if you press uh, Hispanic. Uh, so those uh, structures which were built during the, those times. And then American period, these what you would see, some of the structures built during those times, and of course, the contemporary. So this website, um, actually it's online already, but it's still being developed or improved. And since shared experience is a great learning tool, engagements with advocates of heritage streets is part of the FAURA project's advocacy among the heritage streets that have been featured in the Fauda Project's Heritage Street webinar series are Calle Colon in Cebu with Mr. Bino Guerrero, Calle Crisologo in Vigan with Mr. Bernard Guerrero, and the Rice Terrace in Mayoyao Ifugao, also as a heritage street, no? the terrace as heritage street with Miss Joanna Santiago. So these uh, two webinars were done um, in collaboration with the BA Philippine Arts, Cultural Heritage and Arts Management Program. So, um, since, uh, so since, um, despite the fact that we had the public as our audience, the, our, the, the primary or the targeted audience were uh, students no, in the program. Yes, the Catholic Solago. Okay, and um, just uh, during the week of our festival, we launched the one minute documentary of Memories of Calif Faura. I'll just play it here since it's just for one minute. <laughs> Now, actually, what I remember about Holy Week, which I don't see, actually, I don't really see it anymore, was that there were times at uh, Padre Faura when we would go to church on our way to the church, we would sometimes see some flagellants, either solo or they go by twos, and they're um, barefoot, naked from the waist up, and they uh, whip themselves with I don't know, strings with broken glass at the end. It's their, their penitence, actually. 
So then they were wearing some sort of like a crown of thorns or something on the head. But uh, I haven't seen any this past few years. But in the past, there would eventually one, one or two, but you'll see them walking. Yes, yeah, so when we um when we get when we got back to Miss Peach, we asked her exactly when she experienced this, and uh, it, and she said that it was during her high school uh, days, no, that she got to witness no the, the occurrence of this flagellance along the street. No, it's very interesting. Um, okay, so if you you would like to see that again, just check it in the Faura Project Facebook page. It can be accessed through that page. Okay, so this brings us now to the second part of my presentation, the second and the last part of my presentation. And this has to do with the change in the UP's academic calendar. You know? And one not entirely academic activity, you know? the Lantern Parade. So in the old calendar, we see this situated as a year ender, a most joyous one as a, at that, you know? uh, as Christmas indeed has a celebratory character. In the new academic calendar, this served as a SEM ender. Another change though in the new academic calendar is the inclusion of the month of May in a regular semester. So this inspired the FAURA project to schedule its annual week-long campaign for heritage on this month. As this can also preserve or also serve as a perfect SEM ender activity. This time tagged as the FAURA, as the Flores de Mayo festival. A secular look or a take on a Filipino tradition, promoting local heritage with endemic locals, flora. Okay, so just like the Lantern Parade, the Flores de Mayo Festival has an interdisciplinary character. So all colleges in each of the constituent units of UP are involved in the Lantern Parade, each one incorporating the character of their own college in their lantern. The Flores de Mayo Festival, which first took place in 2018, have all also or always addressed interdisciplinary issues. The first Flores de Mayo Festival had as its theme endemic flowers in the Philippines. The highlight of the week was, was where first the procession of endemic flowers along Padre Faura Street and the UP Manila grounds, and second, a week-long painting exhibit of endemic flowers at the UP Manila Museum of a History of Ideas. So the said exhibit featured the works of Miss Bing Famoso, founder of the Philippine Botanical Arts Society, who, who also was an alumna of BA Philippine Arts, Cultural Heritage and Art Management Program. Painting workshops on endemic flora or flowers were also carried, during the, carried out during the week. The second Flores de Mayo Festival in 2019 was an advocacy for Aroceros Park, the last lung of Manila. Awareness talks were organized to help campaign against the construction of edifices within the park and nooks. And nooks were provided for signature campaign against the building of a gym at the middle of the park. We were grateful to have joined this advocacy as the mayor of Manila eventually declared the park as Forest Park and any structure that would be built on it will be considered illegal. Talks. Uh, for the festival tokens during the festival. So the theme for the 2020 at Flores de Mayo Festival was supposed to be healthy parks, healthy people, inspired by a global movement that aims to harness the power of parks and public lands as a health resource. The promotion of all lands or all, all parks, urban and wild land as cornerstone of people's physical mental and spiritual health, social well-being, and sustainability of the planet was its advocacy. This was the conclusion of the 2014 International Union of Conservation of Nature World Parks Congress, which took place in Sydney, Australia. Contact with nature is essential for human, emotional, physical, and spiritual health and well-being. So this was the context of the sad conference and in the, and indeed all our campaign or all out campaign for the said advocacy followed suit in Canada in Europe and in the United States among others 
And the Flower Project wanted to do its share by making its festival theme. Making, making it its festival theme. But of course, the pandemic happened. Initial projects, though, were earlier carried out for this. The revitalization project of the Plaza de Nuestra Señora de Guía was launched. Uh, we see a no walking mark there because, <laughs> yeah, because of the pandemic. So this was a collaboration with the Sangunian um, Kabataan Chairperson of District 5, Ermita, Miss Marinel Completo, and other councillors of her district who vouched to help maintain whatever the project may contribute to the park. So the project has had a twofold aim. So the first was the greening of the park and the incorporation of pandan plant on the spot where the Nuestra Senora de Guia was sited, standing on a trunk surrounded by pandan leaves. Because when we saw the park, there was uh, no sight of any pandan leaves. But although there was a flower bed no, where it could easily be, be planted. No? So uh, some students belonging to the Philippine, uh, Philippine Arts volunteered to took charge of gathering plants. The second aim was the use and promotion of the park as heritage or as venue for heritage promotion. This became the site then where the Faura Project's Kulay uh, Linang Books was first launched. Uh, volume two of that book uh, with one side colored for children. Uh, this one, we just came up this year. Uh, this, uh, the earlier, it was just for uh, Calia Faura. This one is for Ermita. You see the National Museum of Fine Arts, the Metropolitan Theater, of course, the Philippine General Hospital, and on the right, the National Museum of Natural History, the Tree of Life. This uh, was in the park again no? uh, in 2020. So to participate in the celebration of the Philippine Quincentenary, the third Flores de Mayo festival, uh, which took place the other week, had the theme of 500 years of heritage with local flora. The week of the festival was opened with a conference carrying the same theme. So after the inspirational talks from the College of Arts and Science Dean, Leonardo Estacio and our UP Manila Chancellor, Dr. Carmencita Padilla during the said conference, four papers were presented. And these papers reflected the interdisciplinary nature of the platform of the Flores de Mayo Festival. So I spoke of how the Flores de Mayo Festivals can be a platform for numerous heritage advocacies. Uh, I began by discussing why and how local flora has a place in the celebration of the quincentenary and that in fact, endemic and local flora predates 500 years. Then I proceeded to discuss the place of Ermita in the quincentenary. Miss Bing Famoso spoke of the Philippine Botanical Arts Society, which she founded, and its advocacy in promoting local flowers. Dr. Mercedes G. Planta from UP Diliman presented archival materials in her talk on ladies' choice, medicinal plants, flowers and plants with extraordinary qualities for women in 16th and 17th century Philippines. And lastly, Mr. John Ray Calado, a botanist in the National Museum of Natural History, discussed and compared botanical illustrations then and now. Diverse too were the participants as they come from different fields and from different constituent, constituent units of the university and other organizations. Besides the conference, the week-long con uh, festival featured an online painting exhibit of local flora um, composed uh, by works of um, artists belonging to the Philippine Botanical Art Society. There were also painting workshops. There, uh, this conducted online. They were around four spread out during the week. Uh, participants included uh, stu some students from UP Manila. Uh, being prof uh, Professor Bing Bonilla required her class to attend this workshop, one of this workshop. And another workshop was, uh, uh, although still open to the public, uh, it had a targeted audience and these were the children of Ermita. It's a collaborative project uh, with the, once again, the SK of Ermita. So this is part of the, the Faura Project's uh, um, 
efforts towards community development uh, and community collaboration. Uh, there. So we see on the right, no, Ms. Marinal Completo, supervising the kids. Of course, the, uh, most of the kids were online, but those who did not uh, have access to online, uh, he, he, she allowed, uh, I think, just uh, around seven, seven or eight children. We only see seven on the, on the, uh, on the screen. No? And of course, with proper social distancing and masks, no? <laughs> all of those were considered. And to even make, um, make the, the book further up, uh, or the, the first edition no, of our uh, Likas Linang books uh, available to the project. Now this, can, this was also made accessible online. Now this can be downloadable from the FAURA project Facebook page. To encourage people, yes, uh, there were some activities uh, which could make them, well, sorry, but this ended yesterday, you know, <laughs> um, to color a page and win a prize. So the closing program of the Flores de Mayo Festival was a live online Santa Cruzan using the Dress Up platform. No? So Dress UP or Dress Up is an event where participants grow show creativity in fashion through a photo and or video based on a chosen prompt no? as conceptualized by Ms. Charisse del Castillo. Before the presentation of participants in their and, uh, and their entries, a talk on the origins of the Santa Cruzan was given, which included art analysis of an illustration in, a, in an 825 AD manuscript. The illustration deals with the finding of True Cross of Christ by Queen Helen or Reina Elena and how she figured out which of the three crosses which were excavated in C2 was the true one. So as stated by uh, Professor Celia Bonilla in her interview over Radio Veritas on the first day of our recent third Flores de Mayo Festival, I quote uh, that in the upfront of commercialization and traditions, the presence of the cross validates the performance of the Santa Cruzan. Um, I'll just share. This is uh, if, uh, a short film. Where's my arrow? My arrow is not moving. I'm sorry. Uh, there. I'll, I'll just play a short. This is long, but I'll just play a short part of it. Showing some of the, those who won. I'm sure you guys are excited to know who our Cruzan. winners are going to be. So I will not let you guys wait. Okay, so... Our first runner-up for the prompt, Reina Oharife, is drum roll. <laughs> yes, Ronnie Bawa. So again, this is his photo and video. Uh, let's see his video. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you so much. And congrats again to Ronnie for winning first runner-up for the first prompt. So as I mentioned a while ago, you will be receiving prizes. Um, you will be receiving a mask and also tokens from NCCA. So I will be messaging you later on and ask for your address so we can send it over to you. Okay. So next, for our next winner. So our first runner-up for Reina Ohari Caridad is... Jeffy, yes. So again, this is her photo and her video. Okay, so if you want to see our grand winner, uh, please check out the FAURA Project YouTube page and you will see their Dress Up Santa Cruzan. So I wanted to show it, but there's a limitation of time. So we proceed. So the results, okay. 
in the study. So we just saw how the objectives of the FARA project to revive, revitalize and sustain heritage have all been addressed through its undertakings. In discussing just two of its projects, most of the projects were actually discussed in the process. So the attendance and the positive response of, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, a page was missing, it's all right. So the attendance and positive response of the participants in the third Flores de Mayo Festival and Conference, despite the pandemic, were, in, were indeed heartwarming. And we say yes to the UP Manila Chancellor's call to continue doing this annually. Ultimately, the aim of all these undertakings is valuation of place. That through these activities, an increase in pride of place be bestowed in every stakeholder of Calle Faura and Ermita as a whole. I use the term place as used in phenomenological architectural theory to mean space with memory and meaning, which may either be built and built or both. And I use the word stakeholder in a broad sense, since every Filipino has a stake in the importance of Calle Faura and Ermita as a whole, as this part of the archipelago is part of national patrimony. The diversity of our festival participants confirm, uh, confirm this as well. So the data presented show that although the face of the present day Ermita Manila has changed drastically from its colonial past and uh, the revival of traditions and festivities may in fact be the key for community integration and revitalization. Amidst the various historic turns and power shifts in Ermita Manila, the people in the community themselves holds the key to defining their culture and future. Each one of us who considers Calle Faura, part of her life, whether as resident, student, worker, or even tourist, no? has agency. For we define our culture as much as culture gives meaning and relevance to our lives. So to this, the advocacy of the Faura project lies. So magandang umaga po muli sa lahat at maraming salamat po. Tatapos na po yung aking presentasyon. I will just stop share. Okay, there you go. Thank you, Professor Anchanzar Labor, for taking us back and reconstructing to us through your presentation and advocacy efforts the colorful history of the street that everyone in UP Manila knows by heart. Indeed, Ermita, the University of the Philippines, and its streets hold a rich cultural and historical value for us Filipinos. Thus, we need to revive and revitalize these heritage sites. Before we proceed with the open forum, we would like to reiterate that the UP Manila Quincentennial Commemoration Organizing Committee, through the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, is still exploring more efficient ways on how these certificates can be issued to the attendees of the webinars who have answered the online evaluation form. The e-certificates will be issued after the last installment of the five-part webinar series. The link to the online evaluation form can be found in the Zoom chat box for Zoom viewers and comment box for Facebook Live viewers. It is also available on the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs Facebook page. So now we open the floor for questions and comments. Those in Zoom may use the Q&A function found at the bottom ribbon of your screen. And our face Facebook audience may also send in their questions through the Facebook comments section, and we will do our best to read them out for you. May we call on Professor Alvin Campomanes, coordinator of the Area Studies Program, to moderate our open forum. Magandang uh, umaga po sa inyong lahat. Narinig naman po yung aking audio, ano? So, good morning everyone. Um, I will have to take over the uh, task of moderating the open forum because Professor Karingal has a medical appointment. So sa bahagi pong ito ng ating uh, programa, ng ating webinar, ay uh, binubuksan po natin ang malayang talakayan. So maaari po kayong magpadala ng inyong mga tanong, paglilinaw. Uh, siguro po magbahagi rin ng insights kung meron kayong gustong ibahagi mula doon sa uh, tatlong lektura na napakinggan po natin uh, ngayong umaga. So I believe I received one message from uh, 
Professor um, Mary Dorothy Jose. Uh, this one is for Dr. Kamagay daw po. No, magandang umaga po, Dr. Kamagay. Mapapansin po natin na karamihan sa mga hanap buhay na inako ng mga kababaihan ng ermita noong ikalabing siyam na siglo ay nagsilbing extension ng kanilang gawain sa bahay. Kung kaya't karaniwan na mababa ang pasahod sa kanila. May mga pagkakataon po ba na nagpamalas sila ng protesta o anumang uri ng uncooperative behavior upang maipaglaban ang kanilang karapatan bilang kababaihang manggagawa? Salamat po. Uh, not Uh, I, I will answer the question, not specifically for women cigarreras. Usually the cigarreras were the ones who were a bit, uh, let's we'll call it restive, no? because they feel that uh, as they, they were being exploited. But there was a strike of cigarreras um, in the early part of the 19th century And uh, well, it was um, in general, it was, uh, what do you call this? It was just labeled as a tantrum, not a huelga. They called it an alboroto, alboroto de cigarreras de Manila. So, uh, and since the one who was making the report was a male, there is already that uh, gender bias that females are not, you know, capable Uh, of doing a huelga. It, a huelga is something that can be associated with the male. So there was, uh, in short, uh, a, uh, a huelga, no? but it was downplayed by the male reporter by saying it was just an alboroto or a small uprising or a tantrum. No? But there was. Uh, I feel the cigarreras were more organized then. Eh? Uh, compared to the other uh, women who were like costureras or lavanderas or tinderas or bordadoras, they were more organized, the cigarreras. Yes, there was a strike. No? Yes. Okay, salamat po sa um, dagdag na kaalaman, no, Dr. Kamagay. So meron daw pong uh, strike, um, Professor uh, Jose. No? Uh, meron pa po ba? Abang naghihintay ng iba pang mga tanong, gusto ko pong um, isingit, no, idagdag itong komento ni Rick De Castro para sa lecture ni uh, prof, uh, ni Dr. Uh, Hani uh, Labor. No? I just like to add to your presentation on the Nuestra Señora de Guia and the very name of Ermita. The first structure in Manila to be named uh, Nuestra Señora de Guia is the southwestern bastion of Intramuros, now known as Bastion de San Diego, but was first called Bastion de Nuestra Señora de Guia, which could be in turn named after an, an hermitage that used to be located in the site. La Ermita de Nuestra Señora de Guia, located outside of Intramuros, um, before the expansion of the said city to its site and its transformation into the said southwestern bastion of Intramuros. Thank you for your presentation. Ayun po. So, uh, komento lang rin po no, bilang um, uh, pandagdag. No? Tama po yung uh, komento ni Rick De Castro. Yun pong uh, nakikita niyo na circular na ruins sa loob ng Baluarte de San Diego sa Intramuros. Yun po yung tower ng Nuestra Señora de Guia. At uh, it's one of the oldest forts in Manila. Uh, uh, mas matanda pa, I think, no, halos kasabayan o mas matanda pa sa Fort Santiago. Uh, yes, uh, it is true. In, uh, it is definitely older. Mm -hmm. Mas talaga siya. In fact, siya yung unang-unang fort na ginawa sa area. Pero uh, if you go through its uh, parang records, you see, medyo marupok kasi yung kanyang foundation. Yes. Kaya hindi siya tumagal. Mm -hmm. uh, yung lugar mismo, hindi siya kaaya-aya para sa isang fortification. Kaya nilipat siya medyo malayo-layo. No? Ito na nga yung Fort Santiago. But the original plan was to really make it the fort. No? And ang, ang napakaganda dito, yung, yung positioning ng Baluarte de San Diego, naka, ano siya, parang yung arrow niya, nakatutok dun sa lugar ng ermita. No? Kung titignan mo yung, kung titignan natin yung walls ng intramuros, no? you would see na kahit ngayon, makikita natin na parang meron siyang 
uh, pointed <laughs> ano eh uh, parang pointed portion and it's focused it's directed towards the Neso Señora de Guia. So uh, kaya nga nakakatuwa pati yung mapa ng 1598 map kanina at saka yung pati nga itong hindi ko lang pinakita kasi nga um, for lack of time but yes no definitely and and we take note of the fact that it was named according to the Neso Señora de Guia no yun yung pinakapangalan ng fort mismo. Kaya again to show the importance of that particular um, area no which is uh, in the environs of um, that part of Ermita where UP Manila lies. No? <laughs> Kaya, ayun. So, um, but salamat po sa komento at mm-hmm. na nalang kapagdilad um, na napag-usapan nga natin no? yung kahalagahan ng uh, Baluarte de San Diego usapin natin ngayong umaga. Salamat po muli. Thank you po. Right. Okay. Meron pong isang uh, tanong mula kay Dr. Cleo Tildehau. Um, what office or location within UP Manila has managed to preserve the interiors amid all the constructions and changes that we can consider as part of a tour? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, wala pa pong assessment na ginagawa in detail yung office namin regarding sa mga um, notable features or ano yung natira for conservation management. So, pero nung nag-start po kasi kami with the, sa office noong 2019, ang makikita ko lang po talaga na na-preserve natin ay yung mga details. Like for example, yung stair railings, yung mga handrails, yung uh, layout ng mga hagdan, yung mga uh, steel framing ng mga bintana. So more on details po ang mga na-preserve natin sa interiors. Kasi yung mga veneers po natin, halimbawa mga drywall or walls, ay nag-deteriorate. So may portion po na napapalitan. For example, sa floor finishes naman natin, um, ang ginamit po nila ay halimbawa teraso. Makikita pa rin po natin yung teraso sa Rizal Hall, sa College of Arts and Letters, na preserve po siya sa ating stairway. Um, meron din pong halimbawa gumamit ng mga machuca tiles. Pag nagbasag po kasi yung concrete tiles na yun, um, pwede pa rin po nating palitan ng katulad na material like machuca tiles. So, pinipreserve po natin yung mga ganong type of finishes para uh, ma-remind po tayo kung ano yung, kung paano siya ginawa noon. Okay. Um, Professor Labor, baka may dagdag po kayo. Kasi oh. heritage. Oh, okay. okay. Um, Alright. So, ang, ang tanong ho ba is whether uh, kung anong mga lugar na pwedeng bisitahin? Apo. Uh, yung yung uh, na-maintain raw po siguro o na-preserve yung interiors na pwedeng gawing part ng tour. Yeah, so definitely, I mean, you can you can check out the ano, the fact na meron pa ring ambulatory area sa loob ng PGH, no? Pati yung mga ano niya, pati yung mga um, arched Uh, and broad arched openings no that's very much part of the uh, Burham Parson Burham Parson plan no uh, this is also echoed of course in Mapuas um yung, ano yung nurses home no and then as far as um then for the Rizal, Rizal Hall naman yung ano yung kanyang facade has been has been preserved um pero, but the question is interior right so if if it's all about interior then i suggest um the best would be for me it would be the PGH, no? the interior ambulatory and uh, the wide and narrow uh, openings and the nurses' home. Yes, definitely. And of course, no, um, they can go to, they can visit the UP Manila <laughs> um, history of the muse- uh, history, uh, Museum of the History of Ideas. No? Uh, because in some way, you would still see there the old plan of the old infirmary. And of course, it will showcase or it, it has an exhibit, no? a history and a visual history of, uh, of UP Manila, um, which was simply University of the Philippines back then. Okay. So, marami pong salamat. Uh, meron pa po kaya? Meron pa bang gustong umabol ang tanong o paglilinaw? Um... Sige po, uh, meron pong isa pa rito, no? uh, again from Professor Jose. No? Uh, baka po na-miss lang namin yung detail kanina. No? Tama po ba na si William Parsons ang nagdesenyo ng Rizal Hall? Ano po ang source na maaaring konsultahin tungkol sa arkitektura ng Rizal Hall? Maraming salamat po. Ang um, arkitekto po ng Rizal Hall ay si William Parsons. Okay. 
uh, sa detalye, makikita po natin na dinescribe ito, katulad ang University Hall, sa libro ni Dr. Gerard Lico sa Arkitekturang Filipino. Mm-hmm. Okay, salamat po. May question po from Vice Chancellor Simbulan to Dr. Kamagay. Despite the very strong gender stereotyping on occupations assumed by women during the colonial era, have you encountered records of men performing these jobs like bordaderas, etc.? Mm. Um, I I don't I don't see probably it's the source my primary source because what I did in my primary source was to really segregate all the women. Uh, I didn't look at the entire uh, padron, no. Uh, so this uh, what I consulted were women, but um, I I I the only instance I see a um, a change is in the task of lavandera. There were many uh, lavanderos, especially in the Sampaloc area. But um, in the Ermita area where I saw the uh, women uh, data, I, they, were all, uh, they were all women. But um, I, I, what was interesting in my research was I have the padron but they're all um, uh, segregating the female. It would be interesting to see the padron for the in, with men and women. But uh, from my readings, it was in Sampaloc where you had lavanderos. No? Uh, yes. Okay. Salamat po. Um, okay. Sige po. Um, meron pa ba? Okay, may follow-up question po si Dr. Cleo Tilde Howe. With the COVID pandemic, the high ceilings and big windows are favorable for better ventilation. Unfortunately, many of our offices have been air-conditioned and have given way to low ceilings. Also, what can you do about our unique furnitures? Baka mas si Architect Barnard ito. <laughs> Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, right now, ma'am, we are trying to return the high ceilings um, and remove the mezzanine. So we are um, conducting renovations for Rizal Hall. So tinanggal na po namin, well, tatanggalin po namin yung mga mezzanine floors to make way for the high ceilings and big windows and to return to the initial design intent of the architect. So kasama din po dyan yung uh, renovations for Lara Hall so we are be, being um, mindful about the design intent of the architect. So in terms of um, air conditioning system, so hindi naman po natin talaga mahaalis yun dahil magiging part na po siya talaga ng um, technology. And uh, because of the urban heat, so magkakaroon po talaga tayo ng air condition spaces, especially for the laboratories. What we are going to do is to introduce the VRF system, which is um, to prevent multiple condensing units to be outside the exterior walls. So, magkakaroon po tayo ng uh, isang combined condensing unit that will be um, placed in roof decks para hindi po masira yung ating pasad. And the system will be integrated to the interior rooms. So, yun po yung mga goals po ng university so that we can um, appreciate the exterior the, the exteriors of the heritage buildings more and also para ma, ma- experience din natin yung um, high ceilings and uh, better venti- ventilation that was the initial idea of our architects okay so kung wala na po ay siguro po maari na nating Uh, tapusin ang open forum dito. Gusto ko lang po sabihin at uh, pa, uh, sa mga tagapagsalita, pasalamatan ang mga tagapagsalita sa isang napakayamang karanasan ng pakikinig sa inyo. Uh, truly, it's uh, multidisciplinary. No? Um, meron pong pananaw mula sa kasaysayan, uh, specifically social history at women's history pa ngayon. Eh, di ba? At local history rin po. No? Um, nakita ko po kung paanong nagtatagpo yung mga Um, 
sabihin natin itong mga aspetong ito ng kasaysayan ang pinaka nakakamangha po ay yung detalye tungkol sa uh, pamumuhay ng mga uh, kababaihan sa ermita meron pong pagtingin na ang kasaysayan ay nakasentro sa achievements o sa mga ginagawa ng mga kalalakihan at madalas kung political history ang pagtingin hindi nabibigyan ng sapat na pagkilala itong mga ganitong aspeto ng kasaysayan. So salamat po sa mayamang lektura. Uh, Siyempre, nariyan din po yung pananaw mula sa arkitektura. Uh, bahagi po nun, technological history rin kasi yung mga notes sa construction, materials, uh, na- naaliw po ako. No? At um, sabihin natin, na- nakita natin kung paano na-reflect yung colonial agenda halimbawa ng mga nasa kapangyarihan doon mismo sa arkitektura at urban plano na kanilang ipinatupad. At kay um, Professor uh, Hani naman po, uh, salamat po sa pagpapakita doon sa mga patuloy na pagsisikap, no efforts to uh, promote the heritage not just of uh, Padre Faura but Ermita as a, as a whole. So art and heritage naman po yung pananaw na yan. So busog na busog po kami sa kaalaman ngayong umaga. So, Ay, maram- Prof. Uh, Alvin, Opa. may I say that I really learned a lot from my fellow speakers. Mm-hmm. So, I'm so happy to be with architect Rosalie and Honey and Chan Sars. Uh, she, she's now hyphenated. So I she's now married. Congratulations to uh, to the both of you. Mm-hmm. Hi, ma'am. Uh, likewise, no, I learned a lot. Likewise. <laughs> yeah, I learned a lot. It was a fruitful morning. Thank you very much, Pa. Sige po, maaari na tayong dumako sa susunod na bahagi ng programa. Uh, Haven, uh, Patricia. All right. Once again, thank you for all your questions and insights. We truly appreciate such a lively engagement. Thank you to our speakers as well for their invaluable knowledge. Speaking of which, may we call on again Professor Alvin Campomanes, Coordinator of Area Studies Program, to present the Certificates of Appreciation to our speakers. Sige po. Um, babasahin ko po ang uh, citation. Uh, babasahin ko po ng buo yung una, tapos mamaya po ay uh, yung mga susunod po, ta- pangalan at uh, title ng uh, lektura. Okay? So, the University of the Philippines, Manila, the Health Sciences Center, presents this Certificate of Appreciation to Maria Luisa T. Camagay, PhD, for sharing her valuable time and imparting her expertise as speaker on the topic Working Women of Ermita in the 19th Century during the UP Manila Quincentennial Commemoration given this 21st day of, Mar- uh, of uh, May 2021 at the University of the Philippines, Manila. Signed, Nimia Simbulan, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Carmen Cita Di Padilla, uh, Chancellor. So congratulations po, Dr. Kamagay. Thank you. Thank you. Ang susunod po um, ay para kay uh, Rosalie G. Flores Bernardo uh, for sharing her valuable time and imparting her expertise as speaker on the topic Reimagining a Corner of Ermita in Pre-War Manila during the UP Manila Quincentennial Commemoration. Congratulations po, Architect Flores Bernardo. Thank you. At... Uh, ang pangatlo po ay para kay Hani Libertine at Chanzar Labor, a PhD, for sharing her valuable time and imparting her expertise as speaker on the topic Proclaiming the Unsung, the Faura Project, and Heritage Advocacy in Ermita during the UP Manila Quincentennial Commemoration. Congratulations po, Dr. Labor. Uh, Madami salamat din. Thank you. Okay. Um, Haven, okay na po. Alright, so thank you once again, Professor Campumanes, and to our speakers. We are now on the last leg of today's event. To formally close today's webinar, may we invite Dr. Leonardo R. Estacio, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, to deliver the closing mm-hmm. remarks. Thank you, uh, Haven, for that kind of uh, introduction. Again, I'm uh, Professor uh, Leonardo Stasi Jr. of the College of Arts and Sciences. 
and I am tasked uh, to officially close our fourth webinar series of our UP Manila Quincentennial Commemoration with the theme Irmita, Arabal or Suburb of uh, Manila. On behalf of the UP Manila Quincentennial Committee and the College of Arts and Sciences of UP Manila, our uh, warmest uh, greetings and heartfelt thanks uh, to uh, first and foremost to our uh, more than 115 uh, and, and counting. Uh, the last time I counted is 115. Uh, loyal participants and countrymates uh, that participated uh, from, I, I, I believe, from uh, Mindanao, Visayas, and Luzon, and other parts of uh, the planet uh, uh, to this uh, very uh, important uh, celebration. Uh, maraming salamat po at mabuhay po kayo. Secondly, to our uh, moderators, facilitators, and uh, technical support staff for an excellently managed time and flow of uh, the webinar, uh, Professor Sharon Karingal, Professor Alvin Campomanes, uh, Professor Doty Jose, uh, Sir Haven, uh, uh, Sir Jarby of uh, IMS, uh, Ma'am Patricia, and uh, uh, Sir uh, Arts Perez. And uh, of course, uh, to uh, our uh, uh, colleagues from the UP system for uh, uh, particularly the uh, Quintensional uh, Committee at the UP system level, uh, led by Dr. Pernilla and uh, Professor Santillan. And uh, also uh, I saw uh, a while ago Dr. Uh, Professor Ariel Bitan, our uh, ABP for uh, administration. And uh, of course, to our central administration of UP Manila, led by our chancellor, Chancellor Carmen C. Tapadilla, for initiating and providing material and non-material support to this uh, noteworthy uh, project. Maraming salamat po at uh, mabuhay po kayo. To Vice Chancellor uh, Nimia Simbulan and Professor Celestina Bongkan, for their ever inspiring presence and for providing excellent guidance and close supervision in the overall management of each uh, lecture series. Maraming salamat po at mabuhay po kayo. And finally, to our esteemed and well-respected panel of Scholar Para Sabayan for selflessly and generously sharing with us their experiences and expertise in today's fourth uh, lecture series to uh, Professor Emeritus Maria Luisa Camagay of UP Diliman for her very engaging sharing and restoring of the five leading occupations of women in Irmita on our talk entitled, Working Women of Irmita in the 19th Century. We were all old to know that back then, based on historical documents, majority of working women in Irmita worked proudly and nobly as costurera, cigarera, bordadora, even lavandera and tindera. And in terms of their uh, work outputs, uh, those who have contracted them to do their work uh, uh, give uh, remarkable uh, comments uh, of their workmanship and craftsmanship, uh, the fitness of their work. So uh, we can say that indeed, uh, even that type of work back then, uh, world class, World class uh, ang performance ng ating mga kababaihan. And to architect uh, Rosalie Flores Bernardo of the Campus Planning Development and Maintenance Office of uh, UP Manila, uh, thank you for uh, uh, beautifully walking us through to uh, Irmita way back then, uh, you, uh, particularly the street corners and uh, the canals and the uh, mga pinatawag nating esteros, including the, the communities. No? Uh, napakaganda ng ating mga communi community pala sa Irmita nung araw. And of course, uh, we saw how they were also, also were transformed by uh, the Americans when they came over. Of course, informed by their benevolent assimilationist uh, policy uh, to educate, civilize, and Christianize the Filipinos they, were, they contributed a lot in transforming uh, Ermita 
uh, in, in terms of the community settlements, uh, they put up uh, sanitary barrios, sanitary public uh, markets, and they transformed the Bahay Kubo into a modern uh, bungalow, modern Bahay Kubo. And uh, of course, uh, uh, thank you for also uh, inviting us to reimagine uh, or revisualize how American architecture was used to establish the imperial presence of uh, America in our country by uh, meticulously sharing with us how the, the various building types that were uh, prevalent uh, during the American period and by showing us sample architectural styles to provide an understanding of the agenda of the prominent foreign and uh, local architects who shape uh, the heritage architecture of Ermita and that of UP Manila as seen and uh, restored today. Uh, I think that's one of your attempt at CPDMO uh, to its original character, no? uh, to bring it to its original character. And uh, lastly, for Professor Hani uh, Libertin, al Labor of uh, CSUP Manila for intimately sharing with us the value of working together for a common cause in reviving, revitalizing, and sustaining the rich cultural and, and historical heritage of uh, Ermita, particularly along uh, uh, Faura Street and its environs to her sharing entitled uh, Pro Proclaiming the Unsung, the Faura Project and Heritage Advocacy in Ermita by critically presenting and analyzing maps that raise the continuous importance of Ermita through time and space, she has shown, us, uh, shown to us how a street such as Padre Faura evolved through time and space as influenced by its changing geography, politics, economics, religion, and even everyday cultural practices and rituals that were transmitted from one generation to another. From her historical and anthropological gazing, gazing, she drew inspirations from old and new maps to create and recreate heritage trails of Califara that were meant to highlight important historical and cultural heritage that can be most appreciated by different age groups and academic background. Uh, of course, as an offshoot of these uh, heritage trails, uh, they created the annual Flores de Mayo festivals, which they started in 2018. Uh, this is a week long celebration of uh, heritage uh, in both tangible and uh, intangible uh, uh, materials, so cultural materials. And uh, last week they just uh, celebrated uh, in parallel with the uh, centennial commemoration, no? uh, the uh, Flores de Mayo of, of uh, Padre Faura and focusing on the floral heritage. Uh, and of course, uh, this is championed by their uh, Paura project, which they uh, founded. So in sum, from a macro perspective of a decolonizing framework that uh, interrogates our colonial historicizing of our past from 500 years ago, we have shifted to a more micro perspective of counter-hegemonic historical and cultural sense-making. Last Wednesday, through our esteemed uh, invited guest speakers, we took pride in revisiting, restoring, and relieving how our Filipino ancestors worked together across time and space in establishing Manila and its environs into a sustainable, living, and thriving urban communities before and during the Hispanic period. From that sharing, we learned one lasting legacy from our ancestors, cultural resilience at its best of the Filipino genealogy, geology, history, language, arts and culture, archeology span and ecology. Today, at a closer and more intimate and engaged sense-making, we revisited, reimagined and relieved how Ermita, a Manila, main suburb where UP Manila is located as a settlement, workplace, urban center before, during, and after the Spanish, Americans, and Japanese colonization and invasion continuously produces and reproduces our long-lasting heritage 
of a dynamic Filipino cultural resilience. Muli sa ating mga panauhing tagapagsalita, maraming salamat po sa taus-pusong pagtanggap sa aming imbitasyon na maging pangunahing tagapagbahagi sa aming uh, ikaapat na serye ng UP Manila Quincentennial Commemoration. Sa susunod na biyernes po ang ikalima at pinal na webinar series. Mabuhay ang ating mga ninuno, mabuhay ang sambay ng Pilipino. Thank you so much, Dean Estacio. And that concludes today's webinar. We hope you all learned a lot from today's lectures. We also encourage our audience to follow the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs Facebook page for announcements on the UP Manila Quincentennial Commemoration Webinar on May 28. This has been Patricia Solito and Haven Urbase from the Organization of Area Studies Majors. Thank you very much and have a good day. May we request our uh, panelists to turn on their cameras for a group photo bago po tayo magpaalam sa isa't isa. Kung maaari nyo pong buksan ng inyong camera ay ibuksan po. Okay na po ba? Sige po. Ako na lang po ang kukuha ng picture. Sige po. One, two, three. One, two, three, smile. Maraming maraming salamat po. Marami pong salamat sa lahat. Salamat din po. Hi, Mr. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Mama Lu. Bye. Bye, thank you po. Bye. Honey, ha? You are now hyphenated. Bye, Mr.